The meeting of the Shreveport City Council has now been called to order. Uh, we will have an invocation by Reverend James Green and Councilman Fleury will lead us with the pledge. Would you please stand? Thank you, God, for this day and thank you for this opportunity. We uh, thank you for every good and perfect gift. We actually get um, come into our midst and let us operate this meeting in a Christ-like manner. And whatever we do is for the good of uh, our city and for our citizens. And after it's all done, that we give you the glory and honor and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Join with you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Councilman Bradford. Councilwoman Fuller. Present. Councilman Nicholson. Present. Councilman Butcher. Here. Councilman Fuller. Here. Councilman Green. Present. And Councilman Bowden. Here. And tomorrow, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting, which was Friday, November 22nd. Um, does any council member have any awards, recognition, or distinguished guests at this time? Councilwoman Full. Thank you, Chair. I have a couple of groups. Um, the first is the EAP, the Entrepreneurial Accelerator Program. And Mr. David Smith and Mr. Jay Asher. Y'all can come on up now. Good afternoon. I'm David Smith. I'm the executive director of the Entrepreneurial Accelerator Program, uh, a division of the BRF. And uh, I have my team with me here, and I'll be going, giving you an introduction. But I want to thank Councilwoman Fuller for the invitation. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your continued support. And I just want to give you a quick update on where we are right now. This is my team. We've been in uh, operation for a little over five years. Julie Gillum Milam has been with me the longest. Julie's here. Uh, Karen Chalmers, business analyst. Uh, Nick Oliver, uh, one of my business analysts. The newest business analyst is uh, Brett Brown. Uh, it says University of Miami, but he is from Monroe, so he's a good Louisiana boy. Um, and uh, uh, D'Angelo Williams is my marketing analyst, and my entrepreneur in residence is uh, Jared Bevel from, you probably know, uh, Red River Brewery. So this, this is the team that meets with <coughs> entrepreneurs in Shreveport and Caddo Parish on a daily basis. Now, where did we get our start? Five years ago, we, as a public-private partnership with the City and Caddo Parish Commission, went and looked at how do we establish an accelerator in Shreveport. A lot of the successful cities had accelerators. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do with this accelerator is create jobs, expand the local uh, tax base, and we would focus on those technology-based companies and diversity of capital uh, in the region, uh, and specifically Shreveport. To date, our success, if you look at what we've done, I mean, we've totally, we've vetted over 889 different ideas. Of those, we provide services to 289. Unique, we have a very Shreveport model here. It's very unique. We'll help anybody regardless of where they are in their process. You can be very early on with your idea uh, on a napkin, or you can be, hey, I've got to raise capital to kick this off. We have 70 in our portfolio that have received uh, some form of capital. We've generated 244 jobs. And what does that mean annually to us? about $13.4 million in payroll. Total raise, $97.7 million into Shreveport Caddo Parish. Um, I, I would tell you a lot of that is syndicated money. That money comes from outside Louisiana. We have, we have done 135 educational programs, um, and we, we do everything from junior achievement to university pitch competitions, and I always have at least one intern, and I think my current intern, Mallory, from Louisiana, Louisiana Tech is uh, with us here today. Done. So what, what, what have we seen uh, as far as demographics? That chart really shows you about 52% uh, 
uh, of what we see every day uh, in, in Shreveport, our minority number, we, we try to benchmark ourselves against the Angel Capital Association. About 25% are minority, uh, are women about 15, if, and we're right on par, if not above, the national average. I'll tell you where we're a little low, and for us, you know, we need to focus in this area, and that is veteran-owned businesses. Right now we're at about 4%. It's trending a little higher in other parts of the country, but with Boxdale Air Force Base right, right, right across the river, really and truly, we should be seeing more of those. The industries, a lot of um, health care, as you would expect, uh, a lot of media, entertainment uh, in our area, a lot of tech. 21.5% is technology-based. That's our sweet spot. That's where we're focusing our efforts, and the reason we're really working hard there is those are high paying jobs in our region that, that we focus on. Really and truly, that's my update. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Um, I had an extensive conversation last week with Mr. Smith, so I don't have any more questions for him right now, but I thought maybe you all might have a few. So, Mr. Trevor. Councilman Lips. Uh, Mr. Smith, thank you for being here. I appreciate all the efforts of your organization as you described them to us this afternoon. Uh, what part of uh, your organization's funding is the contribution that the city makes every year? We we'll give you about two hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand. Right? Uh, okay. And, wh and what's your overall revenue? Um, we're right around one million dollars. Is right where we're at. Okay. And, and what does the rest of the funding come from? The rest of the funding comes from the BRF. When we started this, about, I would tell you, between the parish and the city, about 80%, and it's now about 20% comes from private funding. The rest comes from the BRF or other sources. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. That's it. Thank, Thank you, sir. Right. You got off easy. Mayor. <laughs> Um, next up, I have um, Strategic Action Council Minority Business Supply. Are you prepared to speak today, Taylor? Mr. Jameson? Good afternoon. Taylor Jameson, the Executive Director for Strategic Action Council. Um, I believe we have a resolution up today for um, a reallocation of some funds, and I just wanted to uh, come before you. Uh, I've had a chance to speak to each of you uh, over the past few weeks about our funding and the partnership um, that we've had over the few years, and I want to kind of touch on a few highlights uh, of what we've done. Uh, this year, um, our main focus has been um, a minority business enterprise cert certification. And what that entails is uh, there was a corporate partner that we have, uh, Caesars Entertainment. They gave us a call. And they said, well, Taylor, we don't have a local industry here who can certify minority companies. Could you do that for us? And of course, our answer was yes. Um, we started on this. We. we We've got our rough draft of the actual MBE certification, but we figured why just do this for one corporate organization? Um, why not expand it to everybody? And so what, what we started to do is meet with all of our municipalities, um, that includes the port, city of Shreveport, city of Bossier, um, school board, uh, to see if they will come on uh, to this and recognize this MBE certification. Uh, we plan to roll that out mid-January, mid um, and so that program is going to be going on in January. Number two, we have awarded over $10,000 in privately raised scholarships um, through Strategic Action Council to deserving kids in uh, the Transformation Zone over this year. 
Um, one thing that's going on right now, and our chairman has not made it yet. He, had, he got called into the hospital for one of his hospice patients. Uh, but one thing that we've launched this year is our apprenticeship program. And, um, we're in the pilot stages, and we're using a healthcare company who um, is specializing in CNA. Uh, and we are trying to fill the gaps alongside with working with Bipsy um, in Suslo on this to, to make sure that we have this type of program in our area. Uh, we've been meeting about this for a few months, and uh, we'll be finalizing that in February. Uh, main thing, though, uh, business to business. So the, the greatest thing that you can do is B2B in Shreveport. Uh, throughout this year, 2019, we have helped and assisted with minority companies attaining $8 million in contracts. Um, and that sh ranges from companies such as Wheeland, Centerpoint, Billings Steel, and to Caesars Entertainment, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Margaritaville, Boomtown, Brown Builders, McInnes Brothers, um, Cattle Parish Schools, Parish of Caddo, et cetera. Um, so we've been working with these different corporate entities and, and um, public entities who, um, who have supplier diversity goals uh, to make sure that we meet those and, and help meet their goals. I believe y'all have everything else, but I'll open it up if anybody has any questions or comments. Well, uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Council Nelson. Uh, for how long has the city given this $75,000 to your organization? How many years? So it hit us, um, I want to say it's right at nine years now. Okay. This being the ninth year. And, and the, the administration's proposition to the council is that we instead give that money to the African American Chamber of Commerce, to my understanding. Correct. What would the chamber do with that money if it were to receive it? Well, today I won't be speaking in that capacity okay. um, as far as what the chamber will be doing with that money. Um, just with the whole situation, it's put me in a sticky position. So we have Mr. Darren Dixon here um, who can touch on chamber specifics. Okay, is he present today? He is. I don't think everyone realizes that uh, Mr. Jamison is currently the president of the African American Chamber, or the chairman of their board, rather. Correct. Correct. Mr. Chair, before we bring him up, could I ask Mr. Jamison a couple questions? Yes, I'm done. Thank you. Where, where's the rest of your funding come from? So we're funded through the parish. Um, so we received $40,000 from them. Um, this year we were awarded. 35000 from Beard Foundation, um, and we expect we're putting in for, for that same uh, grant for next year and corporate donations. Uh, we have about 25 different corporate partners. 75% um, of those typically have a supplier diversity program, but we work with the rest of them to either uh, start a supplier diversity program or help partner. So not asking you on behalf of the chamber, but on, since you are kind of in a very awkward position here, I think. Um, what? Tell me why we should give this money to your organization as opposed to the chamber. I don't want to get into. I don't. This shouldn't be uh, why against the African American Chamber against Strategic Action Council. Um, I think both organizations are great, and I don't want to go into why one should be should be awarded and why. Why one shouldn't? I just I feel like that there needs to be a distinction of, in, sure. in my mind, and, and we talked about this that mm -hmm. this is the best place for the. I'm concerned about the city's investment and where our dollars go because I've said this over and over again, and I'm going to probably restate this about ten times between now and the next couple of weeks. We are not in a place. We are not in a place to be philanthropist mm -hmm. in the city of Shreveport right now. Things have changed in the last ten years, and I want to make sure that as a councilman that I am getting for those dollars that we do send outside of the government, um, I want to make sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck. Sure. So I think that was a fair question to ask and, and we'll ask the we'll ask the chamber that, that question and see, you know, exactly what they do. Um, to me, I, I mean I just don't know enough about either one of the organizations to really like we talk I, I just don't know. I mean, I don't see any reason to change it. Um, but I also think that like I said, we are not in a position 
in the city of Shreveport to be giving out dollars unless we know that those dollars are going to be used for something. I think your nine-year track record helps to prove that a little sure, bit. Sure, so. sure. And one thing I'll touch on, it, the proof is it's in the work. And so when you receive a return on your investment, when you're able to, to put in $8 million of minority contracts in the private sector, uh, you, you're you getting a great return on right. your investment. Uh, and also, as far as the the process, I know that's one thing that we talked about, it, it, what pays for what. Uh, it, I've We've gone through the application process for the city of Shreveport, and we'll be adhering to all of the guidelines that the city, uh, the city council has put forth uh, for civic appropriations to make sure that we're in line uh, in following the actual guidelines. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Chair. Right. So, from the 18, you said from the eight, from this eight million. So, what, what in 18 or in 2019 did that come from? But what did you produce in 18 or 19? That's what I was with with our corporate sponsors, the ones I listed earlier. That was um, that was from the metrics of, of us calling and working with them directly with our MBEs. Uh, typically, what happens is uh, we'll get a call from one of our corporate partners, and they'll let us know what projects are actually coming up. And um, we almost we always act like a, a mentor, pro, like a protege mentor program, to where um, we will match up certain construction companies, marketing companies, whatever that particular project is, uh, to those corporate contracts. And one uh, in particular? Yeah, all of the ones that I named earlier. You, I can read that well, off I'm just, from eight, and just one from 18 and 19. Those are all from 18 and 19. Okay. Yeah. And I can provide that for the record. It's in y'all's emails. But all the companies listed here are from this year. Did you, did you want to vote? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Now, they had a question. Councilman Butcher, it, it, it's a country western song. It says, one has my heart, and the other has my bill for it. <laughs> That's the position you can. <laughs> they both got my heart. <laughs> which which so, always relates to a sticky situation. <laughs> <laughs> but the question, but I mean, I, I have to agree with, with, with uh, Butcher, though. So the, the best person to answer those questions would have been you. Uh, which, which, why not one over the other? So, um, yeah, that that, that would come from yes. Yeah, ma'am. I think my issue is it shouldn't be one or the other. I think they both provide services. I think that they both have missions that should not be compared. I think that the the chamber is an advocacy group, and that by, by that strategic action council is a capacity building group. They should never be fighting over the same pool of money to begin with. There are other funds that we might be able to look at to consider for African American Chamber instead. And he shouldn't be sitting here having to say, this is why this group deserves it more than the other, as much as saying, this is the mission of this group versus the mission of that group, so we can decide based on their missions objectively on where we think the dollars should go. Or vice, or vice versa. Right. But, Chair, we're in the position we're in, and that's one of the questions we're asking. Right. No, that's well, we can get out of that position by looking at all of our allocations. Oh well, I, 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 I mean, we can go through all of them and, and you know I set, mean, set set a cap for all nonprofits. We can do that, but um, at the, right now, at this particular point, we're speaking on, and I'm 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 ready to vote on that at any time. Let me say that. But um, let me ask you this: So, your salary, what part of that seventy-five pays your salary? Oh, uh, what would it pay? For the twenty, so it only can cover up to fifteen percent. Okay, which is. Are you asking me what my salary is? Mm -hmm. um, if you do the math, it's fifty-six thousand dollars. Then, whatever fifteen percent of that is, so seventeen thousand dollars, maybe. Not even. Maybe twelve thousand seven hundred dollars. So you're at fifty-six, and it can pay seventeen. Does that fifty-six include benefits? Correct. So ninety five hundred. Yeah. Fraction of the Okay. All right, that's not a question like that. Would it be appropriate to have uh, Mr. Dixon come speak in the that's chamber? Fine. Mr. Dixon, would you can come I, can I, sorry. Yeah, let me 
Can I chat with you really, yeah. really quick, uh, Mr. James? So, Mr. James, my office requested documentation from you mm -hmm. to show uh, exactly what impact you were having on the community. As Councilman Butcher said, we have to be very uh, careful with the dollars that we spend. Mm -hmm. um, in those documents that we received from you, an uh, actual granular breakdown of the specific company that you work with mm -hmm. and the contracts that were yielded wasn't provided. Mm -hmm. uh, we could tie no uh, like phone calls to numbers or any of that other stuff. So it was lack of documentation was mm -hmm. the reason why we said that or we thought that it would be much money would be much better spent with the African American Chamber. They sure. provided a great detail of documentation, programming that they had, where their funding was coming from, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the for instance, can you go back over the numbers for you said the parish gives you forty thousand and who else gives you funding? Correct. Well, it changes from year to year, but this year um, we've been awarded seventy-five thousand from the city, forty thousand from the parish, uh, thirty-five thousand from Beard Foundation, yep. and corporate and fiscal year twenty nineteen. Correct. Correct. Okay. So, the does the parish has the same same stipulation with your, for instance, your pay that the city does, being a public entity? Fifty percent. Fifty. Fifty. Half. What? What do you? That's their stipulation, 50% for your salary. The parish can pay up to 50% of your salary. Correct. Okay. Okay. Pro and, it's, and it's not just for the salary. It's based off of programming. Okay. Okay. So uh, so the Beard Foundation's funding, because to cover the gap, if only nine, you know, $9,500 of what the city is providing to you goes towards your salary, then the parish would have to pay, and it's 50% of that you got, uh, 20, 28 mm -hmm. plus nine, you at 37. So, a club, I mean, about 20,000 at 35k is coming from the Beer Foundation, and that doesn't leave much money for other programming. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you heard uh, EAP get up a minute ago, and we provide a very small piece of their actual budget, sure. And that's what we have to do. We have to make sure that the organizations that our dollars are going into, uh, we're supplementing budgets and we're not taking the, the the brunt of the budget right so that's the calculations I want the council to know that were our calculations from our side on why we made these decisions it's it's like data driven policy the data that we got we were able to make the decision based off of it so if you can get us more granular details on the, the, the companies that you've worked with and we can we can look at these numbers we can audit these numbers like we did for the African-American Chamber mm -hmm. and be as uh, detailed with them then we'd be happy to change these numbers but at the time with the information that we have that's the reason why we made the decision. Sure, and, I, and for the record, we've been trying to meet all year uh, to make sure that we uh, show exactly what metrics that need to be shown. Uh, we have a meeting this week, but it's in December. Yeah. So I, I would love for in 2020, if, if we do come to some sort of an agreement, for us to uh, strengthen that partnership throughout the whole year. Yeah, and we've met. I mean, we had this. I asked you for the doc, We asked for the documentation. I think in August, September, and again we asked March twenty second. What was it? March twenty second. We asked you for the documentation in March. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So you know, in March, uh, when you give us that that feedback, we need to see. We needed to see those numbers, and that's, that's exactly when we. As soon as we reached out to the chamber, that's the the detailed degree of numbers that we got. So, um, I mean. We, we can we can send an email to drop the criteria or send an example of the criteria, but you know we need as many details as possible, and that's not specific to you. That's objective to any sure, organization sure. that we're providing funds to. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, I'll conclude my remarks with Mr. Jameson at the podium by observing that there's been some discussion of a of a sticky situation or a, a conflict that arises from the fact that he is affiliated with both the African American Chamber and the organization for which he is speaking today. That's not a conflict of his making. That's not his fault. And I, I don't want anyone to come away from this thinking uh, that Mr. Jamison has, has done something he should not have. He just happens to be involved with two worthy organizations uh, who are competing for funding. And uh, appropriately, I think he has another representative from the Chamber here to speak to. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? That's it, That's it for me. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dixon. <coughs> I 
Good afternoon. Uh, of course, I'm Darren Dixon, and in full disclosure, I'm on both boards. I'm on the Strategic Action Council board as well as the African American Chamber. Uh, when I heard of, uh, of the chamber possibly getting funding, I was excited, and, and because it was kind of historic, because we've never received any uh, support uh, from the city of Shreveport uh, since our existence, uh, but. When I heard how the funding was coming, I was uh, conflicted because uh, it kind of pits uh, two organizations that have somewhat similar uh, intent, but but uh, very totally different missions. Uh, and as I've been talking to uh, uh, the board at Strategic Action Council as well as at the chamber, uh, I want to see to see how can we. Uh, bring a resolution that would benefit both organizations, and that's where I stand today. Uh, what does the chamber? Do? The chamber has done a lot and has grown over the years, and but we are still uh, in uh, have a challenge of, of growing and, and reaching our fullest potential because they're uh, uh, because of resources. But as would most uh, minority organizations. Uh, 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 well, we could we we have so many ideas and so much work, but we we tend to get under resourced. You can look at uh, HBC. I could go on and on about organizations and the uh, disparity in resources. But my uh, plea to you, gentlemen and lady, today, and uh, and, and hopefully uh, uh, the administration could uh, could you know, buy into the fact that we would like to see some resolution that not hurts uh, the Minority Supply Institute, but, uh, but, but uh, helps both organizations. I do understand uh, 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 sitting in your position, you, especially with the uh, budget uh, concerns you have uh, going forward, that you have to be wise in your investments. Uh, I understand that. So uh, I, I would stand to say that I don't think you would be making a bad investment investment investing in either one of the organizations because I think both of them do great work and bring some return to uh, this community. So that's my say. If you have questions for me, I'll, I'll address those or get out of your way. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Th th thank you for coming up and, and kind of explaining the difference in the two organizations. It's, uh, but I, I do think that you did say one thing. I think your ultimate goal is the same. It's just figuring out the way that we need to allocate the funding to help you all out. And I think that regardless, both of your objectives are worthy of, of our stewardship, I think. Um, it's just trying to decide. And, and I think that historically we have, we have relied on the mayor to make this decision. Um, but I also think that it's a new council and a new mayor, and I think that there are some things that we can look into. So I just appreciate you all both coming in and giving your side of it. and. Uh, we don't actually vote on it today, so uh, you know we'll have some time to consider it and see what we need to do. But uh, I, I want to assure you that, that the money will be used for the objective of these two organizations. That, appreciate it. Thank you. Any more? If, if I have anything to do, I'm only one, but if I have anything to do with it, it'll be, appreciate it'll be used it. for that. Anybody else with a question? I appreciate you all time. Councilman Fleur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. As you recall, last uh, council meeting, I had made an uh, inquiry about making a motion to rescind. The city attorney's office had been asked to prepare an opinion regarding whether or not motion to rescind is proper in regards to the city council's decision on MPC case 19 dash 301 dash WFC. The city attorney has opined and said that uh, uh, an opinion has been uh, rendered in regards to uh, against uh, my motion to rescind. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilman Chairman uh, Jerry Bowman Jr., I appeal this decision to you uh, and ask that you reconsider and render a uh, decision in it as chair of the council. I, um, 
I always um, respect uh, City Attorney Creel and her opinions, and um, I concur with her findings. Therefore, those of you in the audience uh, here for that, uh, that uh, motion to rescind will not be uh, taken up today or any time going forward. It has uh, been put to arrest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Thank for you. your consideration of you. uh, my request. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Flurry, I'd just like to say thank you for being brave enough, for being stood enough to make that comment as to what you just did, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Green. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to invite Scott Martinez from NLAP to make a presentation to us concerning a tax credit. This is actually only agenda with Inferno. What? If, yeah, that's what I'm here for. You'd like to wait until later in the yeah, meeting? Yeah, with Mr. Organic. You can, but you'd like to yeah. present now and be able to depart? Or? It, yeah, I'm fine with it. Okay. Whatever <laughs> whatever the, the council or this body deems why appropriate. Why don't, you, why don't you say what you need to say now, and that'll save you some time. <laughs> okay. That's my <laughs> suggestion. With, with, the, with your approval, I'm, I'm happy to do that, sir, with the councils. I'm Scott Martinez, president of the North Louisiana Economic Partnership. I also have with me today Alan Organic, president and owner, <coughs> excuse me, of Inferno Manufacturing, located here in Shreveport. I'm before you today to discuss an amendment to the fact sheet on their industrial tax exemption program, which was done um, last year. There was a discrepancy between the amount uh, that the state represent that's on the state documentation and the local documentation. On the local documentation, the value is $480,000, which was representative of the value of one machine. They ended up doing two machines, which was the initial um, intent, um, so which drove that value up to over a million dollars. So they actually did more investment um, than, than was in the original documentation at the local level. And this is today, I want to bring it before the council to, to get that amended. So it's, in, con, it, so it's consistent with the amount that the Cato Commission amended last week at their meeting and that's, um, that's at the state of Louisiana um, for their um, consideration. Just to give you some background, many of y'all are new on the council since this was voted on last year. Mr. Organic's grandfather started this company in Shreveport in 1922. It's a family-owned business. Um, you know, they anticipated having 25 employees when they did this uh, initial application. They're up to 27 employees. If you look at the amount that they pay, irregardless of any abatement or exemption, just to the city of Shreveport, their taxes every year, their property taxes are over $17,000. So they've been here since 1922. They've paid taxes. Their payroll is way north of a million dollars. They provide benefits to their employees at 100% as far as their health care. They provide um, to the employees and their families health care as well at a much reduced rate. You know, a lot of discussion when they were redoing the ITEP two years ago with Governor Edwards' executive order was this was really predominant to big business and multinational corporations. This is an example of a family-owned small business in Shreveport that's able to utilize this incentive and grow their family business here in Shreveport. And they've been from my perspective and everyone's uh, I've talked to in Shreveport, they've been good corporate citizens and, and good members of our, our community. So I would ask that, the, that this council considers amending that fact sheet to take into consideration that new amount that's, that's representative of the value of both of those machines rather than the one. Um, the Cato Commission and the Board of Commerce and Industry have both approved those higher amounts. Mr. Chairman. Vice Chair Nichols. Uh, Mr. Martinez, thank you as always for being here. I'm very appreciative of the work your organization does for Northwest Louisiana and for the city of Shreveport. I made this request to a member of your staff, but I'll, I'll make it in public mm -hmm. on the record. I'd, I'd like to make sure that every time NLEP uh, asks us to take action on a potential tax exemption, uh, that it provide uh, an economic impact analysis. Yes. Sir. Uh, so that we have data on which we can base our decision. Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of, there uh, has been, 
quite a lot of discussion about whether local entities like ours should have a role in this process, but we do, of course, by order of Governor Edwards, and I want to make sure that we responsibly exercise that responsibility. And you have provided an economic impact analysis in this case. I, I, I note that it uh, indicates that we are, over the next five years, uh, neither saving nor, uh, nor spending money on this exemption, that the net impact is zero. Uh, but I, I would encourage my colleagues, particularly in cases of exemptions that are uh, of more significant financial impact to the city, to uh, require that those exemptions be justified. Because when we give an organization a tax exemption, we are giving away the city's money. Thank you. And for reference, we'll have at least two more before this body um, within the next four or five months. I know, Mr. Flurry, you're very familiar with one, and we'll be bringing some more um, before this body that are expanded, local companies that are expanding in the city of Shreveport. One, excuse me, one that's a new company and the other that's doing a significant expansion in the city. All right. Is that it? You want to? Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Mr. Perkins, do you have any uh, distinguished guests at this time? Um, yes, I do. I, uh, first, I want to call up, uh, today we have Mr. Wade Davis, uh, my appointee for the position of airport director in the audience. Um, he's here and can answer any questions to the council uh, you may have uh, prior to confirmation. He will also be with us tomorrow. Mr. Davis, you would come up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. If, um, is that all? That's all we want. Council, we actually met last night. Yes, we did. It, it was uh, very interesting. Uh, we were having dinner at the same at the same place. Um, I'm glad you're here. Glad that you are uh, wanting to make Shreveport your new home. I, I know that uh, it's been a uh, point of contention with the airport over the last year at least for us uh, newly elected council members and and um, and I think the mayor as well has worked very hard to to try to uh, to accommodate a lot of things that have been going on at our downtown airport I'm sure I, I just would like to ask if you're aware of everything that's going on there correct yes I am okay <laughs> what? no I'm just trying to make sure <laughs> he didn't run so let's make sure he buys his house first yeah exactly <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I'm assuming that you and the mayor have discussed, Mayor, this, the, all the issues going on and where we where we are now. I think the mayor has worked pretty hard over the last two or three months to to work with the FAA. So I just year you know. year. Well, I mean, but the last few months you've really been now a year a year. Okay. Yeah, yeah, year okay. since I got in office. <laughs> but um, I, I just wanted to make sure we knew that, and then I, I think there's a couple other things. Uh, Back when we first took office, in fact, one of the, the first votes that we had was to make the uh, regional airport an international airport. And uh, from what I understand, you're from an international airport, which is a little bit smaller than regional. I am, yes. But uh, so you're familiar with that and able to uh, to do that. I think my biggest thing with the airport is this: I would like to see us become international with cargo and things like that. And I think where we're at, that we're in a perfect spot. To be able to grow our airports and to bring industry like Scott and, and LAP and to bring industries here because of our airport and, and the expansions and things that we're doing. So, um, anyway, I just welcome you. And um, if anybody else has any questions, um. well, Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, I normally don't ask questions, but um, the last person we had. Um, I was prepared to vote on her the next day, and she left. So I just wanted to know if you could commit to staying at least another day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> so that, yes, that's sir. my question. I mean, so well, is it you Shreveport know. Airport, uh, both uh, regional and downtown, has, it's got some great bones to yes, it. Sir. There's excellent opportunity for expansion right. there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. And we will be voted to confirm tomorrow. It's not, yes. It's on the agenda. Am I correct about that? Yes, sir. All right. Um, Mr. Davis, you, the fact that you're here today, uh, I appreciate that. 
And uh, I, I, I do appreciate the fact uh, your willingness to come and, and to uh, help serve and um, keep our airports up into the position that they need to be in. So um, again, I just want to say thank you and thank you, Mayor, for uh, your team uh, reaching out to Mr. Davis. Uh, you was my first choice, so let me say that. I, I don't know what the mayor was doing, but I just want to tell you, you my first choice. So thank you. Thank you. And by the way, the airport is in my district. So. Wonderful. All right. That's it. That's all I have. Councilman Bradford, anything from you, sir? No, sir. All right. That'd be it. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you very thank much. You. I'd like to thank you for all your hospitality, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, counselors. Thank you. All right. Thank you, too. Administration, anyone else? Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, I want to address the letter that I got from Councilman Butcher on Friday, December 6th. Uh, and the same day, it was a press conference with uh, Councilman Fleury and Nicholson. Uh, the letter's um, encouraging us to reach out to the Louisiana State Police as well as other local law enforcement agencies to assist the Shreveport Police Department in efforts to keep all of Shreveport citizens safe in light of the recent rash of senseless, violence, vi senseless violent crimes that have happened in our city. Uh, public safety remains my top priority. Um, I think Councilman Fleury and I, we sat in that joint task force meeting, I think the second, second quarter. We, we have joint task force meeting with all federal, uh, state, and local law enforcement agencies pretty regularly. Uh, but when there is a rash of events like this, we will um, break that tradition and, and reach out and bring more resources in. Uh, so I, too, am appalled at the recent criminal acts that have taken place in our city. One loss of life is one too many. However, I want everyone to know that we are already working with the Louisiana State Police and other law, local law enforcement agencies. Um, we wrote, myself and the police chief have written letters uh, requesting for resources from those state agencies as well. And we, it's not just lip service that they're saying we're supporting you, we're supporting you. They actually have been, been providing bodies. Uh, clearly for security reasons, we don't want to talk about how many additional assets that they're providing us to, to assist us in our neighborhoods. Uh, but we are working together and we will continue our efforts. Uh, our homicide numbers um, continue to go down, but one is, again, one too many. Uh, our efforts, uh, we will continue to fight till we have zero crime. We will continue that fight as impossible as many say it is. Our efforts will continue to, to push in that direction. Uh, so I welcome the support of council as well as the offer to put more money behind our public safety efforts. As I've always said, we have to do this and work together. Uh, the more voices from council that we have, the louder our voice is in this community. So thank you for your efforts and we'll continue to stay on it. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Perkins. Mayor, thank you for the response. Mr. Harris here. You want to have anything related to the property standards for Mr. Harris? Uh, real quick, Mr. Harris, did you go over there on Gideon and Bethany and all that and look at some of those things we talked about? I rode through there and there's just too many to list. I sent the inspector over and I'll send you an update tomorrow. Email. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, public, I think that's it. Is that it? Anyone have anything else? I think I sent you my list. That's it. We have a public hearing tomorrow and on resolution 132. 132 of 19. Correct. It is tomorrow. Okay. And Ms. Jones, will there be any legislation added on tomorrow? I'm not aware of any. Okay. And we have the. I'm sorry. 132? 165 to be added, you say? Mm -hmm. No. That's from the public hearing. So what will be added tomorrow? Uh, resolution 165, honoring the life and legacy of civil rights pioneer Dr. Seal Simpkins. 65. Okay. We'll do that tomorrow. Okay. We have the following. We'll have to do that tomorrow, right? What? That's on tomorrow, correct? Okay. Yes. We have the following request to speak. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first I have a request to speak from Mr. Tom Marcineau, uh, Mr. Deb Francis, and Mr. Alvin Meester. I assume they no longer care to speak given the disposition of the matter. Yes, sir. Yes, thank okay. You. Very good. Mr. John Johnson. <laughs> Yeah. 
Mr. Johnson, if you could state your name and your address, please, sir. You have three minutes. My name is John Johnson. Address is 1627 Fulton Street, Shreveport, Louisiana. <coughs> and I'm here on behalf of Mr. Alonzo Sanders, trying to get his building resurrected, and I'm all for it because the building will serve the community, especially for the young, young, the younger generation. The younger generation, they have a lot of the guys don't have anything to do but hang out and do illicit things that you know that uh, brings the crime rate up. Mr. Sanders' building would serve as a entertainment complex. It's going to teach the young guys how to invest in property, real estate, how to go to the auction and flip cars, as well as housing and record music studio for the entertainment industry. And I think that would be a big plus for the community in giving those guys something to do and something to look forward to and provide a little hope for them. That's that a question. So I heard what you said. It will be this purpose for us. So it still will be a used car? No. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. That's what I wanted to make sure. That's what, that's, that's, that's what we had got. That's all I had got. So I wanted to make sure that that was an add-on to Well, I'd like to, Chairman Bowman, I thought this property was requested to be resumed for use as a used car lot. Is it going to be something more? I, I just don't, I don't know. I want to understand what the request is. Will it, what, what, uh, will it be more? Futuristically down the line, I got plans okay. for it to be something more, which is something like a school. Why don't you come up with yeah. a place yeah. Well, I'd be happy to call. Right now, it's just part of that. Did he put it in the car? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Sir, unless you have something more. No, that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Mr. Jeremiah McDade. Sir, if you could please state your name and address, I would appreciate it. Um, Jeremiah McDade, 1548 West 58th Street, Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, basically, well, I'm employed by this guy. Um, maybe a few years back, I was a little homeless. Um, he gave me, taught me financial awareness, uh, job training. So I'm pretty sure that when he uh, get his building uh, up and running, that's going to be part of it also. Um, me being here, is, that's, those were my... Uh, basic functions for, for coming is to make sure that y'all know he is employing people and he, uh, he is beneficial uh, to what's going on right now in that, in that particular area, basically. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kevin Teller. Kevin Teller, uh, 4035 Dixie Boulevard, Shreveport, Louisiana. I'd like to say I'm just a, a neighbor of Lonzo, and uh, I work with him sometimes, and uh, uh, he seems to be a good uh, influence on some of the younger guys that he hires, and uh, I've met quite a few of them since I've been working with Lonzo, and uh, the, the build is a good idea, and I think... Uh, uh, Trying to, I'm trying to say the right word. Uh, uh, I can't think of the right word. It escapes me. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Derrick, and I apologize, I can't read your last name, but it's concerning the same matter. Would you get out? Sir, state your name and address for the record. Derek Thrash, uh, Thrash. I live at uh, 506 West 76th Street, Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, Mr. Alonzo is a, a good pillar to the community. He uh, has a, a lot of aspects for his lawn services. That's not just as it is, just not going to be a car lot. It's also going to be a lawn service. And me myself, I'm, I, I work construction. I have a small business. Uh, <clears throat> A contract with him 
for us the lawn services and it's just not going to be a car light up there because I plan on opening up in the building I, I plan on having a, a lawn services through his conjunction and, and a, a roofing contract through his conjunction and he has a good pillar to the community and his social liability is going to bring a whole lot of income to the streetport community and it will be a good asset for his building to go up Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you all. Uh, Mr. Merle Lane, if I'm reading that first name correctly. How y'all doing? Hello, sir. Merle Lane, part of 601 Dixie Boulevard. All I got to say, I've been in the military. I've been on Mr. Sanders over 20 something years ago. What he's trying to do is a helpful thing to the community. I'm all in favor of him building his bill. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Give the man a chance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bill Weiner. I am <coughs> I'm Bill Weiner. I live at Number two, Longest Lane, Treeport, Louisiana. Uh, I'm here to ask something. I didn't really know how to do it except to come here. Uh, there's been a lot of input on the development along Cross Bow. Hours and hours promoting it. Very little input from the city uh, citizens to address the deficiencies and how it might bankrupt Shreveport in the future. I'm going to ask you to consider having a special council meeting with only one subject on a different day to discuss the impacts of doing this and discuss the problems back and forth. Not a three minute thing, it's information so that you can make an informed decision. This person says, do this, but this person happens to know reason not to do it. You can hear all the information and <clears throat> then go forward from that. So I'm asking you to try to look into setting up a special meeting because it's so important for our future and it's so large and it involves so much city property. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, my final request to speak is from Matt Arundel, but uh, there's not an indication as to whether that's for today or tomorrow. I don't see Mr. Arundel in the audience, and so we'll assume he's coming tomorrow. But tomorrow. Uh, those are all the requests. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I make a comment really quick on some of the series of speakers? Mayor Parker? Uh, I just want to thank Mr. Sanders. I don't get to vote on zoning matters, but, but clearly you have an impact on the neighborhood and the community. I want to thank you for having that positive impact. Whatever you got going on, it, it's working. You're touching a lot of lives. So. I just want to say, you know, keep up the good work. I appreciate it. I, I had a request to speak that was in there. I don't know why. Did you get it? I, I, I did not see it, but if you submitted one, Mr. Sanders, on time, so I want to hear from you. I didn't get it, but I, I, I don't have an objection to who coming up to speak if no one else does. <coughs> Thank you. I wanted to submit this to the council. You know, um, I started this building 2016, and due to a lot of things, I'm being put through a huge hassle. So it seems um, one of the main persons, Elizabeth Swain, opposes my building, and I would like to say that she has no legal residence in that area, and that they say that they oppose me because they want to keep the area historic but legally, according to the UDC, it's not a part of the historic district. It's actually an opportunity zone, which was actually created for development in minority, low-income areas, underdeveloped areas. So part of the UDC, another opposer, which Ms. Swain got to help her, the Fertitas, it is a historic building but it's not part of the historic district. Um, I, 
I'm kind of afraid here, to be honest with you. I, I keep getting things from my friends saying, hey, don't come up here and oppose certain people. Um, don't say certain things um, because you don't want to make enemies within the NPC, the city council. They'll keep you from doing certain things. But me, I always got to follow my heart. And if I have to be a martyr, then that's what it is. So I want to put this on record. Certain people, officials that I feel have a conflict of interest um, and have showed abuse of power to me and malicious intent, um, part of the MPC. But speaking on the city council, I would like to ask, and I don't know because I'm familiar with certain court procedures, but not with the MPC, I would like to ask for the chair or whoever would be in charge to call the executive session to remove Levette Fuller from the voting tomorrow. Um, I got an email of public record from the MPC which stated to Levette Fuller, Thad Thrash, and the Fertitas, and I quote from Mrs. Elizabeth Swain, guys, I need your help. And I just don't feel like that Elizabeth Swain should be able to summon and shut down a business at will. And if so, I would have to consider her the mob and Levette Fuller must be Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, Mr. I was Chairman, uh, would you ask the speaker to uh, suspend, please? Under our rules of order, Section 111, you cannot call out a city councilman in, like this gentleman just did. And I don't mind him coming and speaking and saying what, but you cannot use this forum as the purpose of in, in Section 111. Okay, I wasn't aware of the rules. Rule so on that, please. Okay. Yeah, we, so I'll suspend that. Please, we got the we got we have the your, your sheet that you submitted. So mm -hmm. no okay, names. okay. Well, um, I'm being told I need to build a studio uh, by certain people. That's not what I want to do. I'm thinking it's maybe because I'm a rapper, and certain people feel like I should sing, dance, and rap. But I want to be a businessman. I aspire to have a multi-million dollar company. I do not want to build a studio. I don't feel like I should be forced to build a studio. I want to do a call out first, multiple other uses later on down the line as I gain income. Um, I have a lot of people um, that will be here tomorrow in support of this. I've already had several people write in letters, um, possibly about 50 people show up to speak during the MPC, and several will be here tomorrow. I don't know how many can speak, but I plan on coming with a lot of people. Um, the community is behind me in the area, um, not, as, not only that, but the entire Shreveport. And um, I just feel that no decisions should be made or predicated on power, influence, or friendship, but ethically it should be made on equality and the rights of a citizen to use S his sir, land the, for. The clerk has advised me that your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to uh, let. Uh, I think it's under appeals. Am I right? Yes, sir. The last on the agenda. I don't see it. I don't see. Oh, that's one for sure. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Councilman Brown. Representative from MPC, you're coming to the mic. He is watching. He had cataract. Oh, well. Stephen Gene is here. Is this only? Is this only agenda? It's only. It's only? It's only. 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 It's Relate to us regarding this this, uh, this gentleman and his uh, concern for uh, resigning. Resigning. Well, yeah, I, I can tell you that what his request was. Uh, although he did say he wanted to have a used car lot, his request was to restore the zoning that once was in place on that property prior to the UDC, which was B3. The equivalent to that is C3. So he would like to have that restored. 
um, <clears throat> there are a number of, of course, uh, in any district, there are a number of permitted uses in a district, and some of those re require special use permit. In this particular case, even if he was to get that zoning restored, he would have to obtain a special use permit for that specific use. And what was the position of the MPC on this request? Uh, to, to recommend denial. Recommend denial? Yes, sir. And the reason was, again? Uh, I believe it had to do with the compatibility of, of, of the area and the desire for that to be. It's more residential in, in, in character. Uh, there's, there's only one. Uh, on that side of the street, there's really not any, uh, any commercial enterprises currently there. Uh, it's, it's primarily residential, although there's quite a number of vacancies. Uh, and, and so the purpose, the, the reason behind what they were doing was to uh, they listen to a lot of people from the from the area that were concerned about the about that particular use and a more intense use uh, than what the character seems to be right at the current time. Did you, did you what other factors did you consider? Did, did, the, did the staff as well as the board was they consistent in their? In their position? Well, other, other things that they considered was a master plan uh, land use map also showed this um, as a residential in character rather than uh, as a uh, commercial area. So um, we can't speak to, to what how particular individuals voted on that, but it just seemed the consensus of the uh, what was put on record that was the reason for for denial. Can I answer any other questions? Sure. Councilman Green, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Are you familiar with the, he brought up an email that uh, Liz Wayne sent. Are you familiar with that? Did you all get an email from? Well, I know he's had a public record request uh, that we were providing uh, certain emails. I, I vaguely remember an email. Uh, it's, it's not unusual for the DDA to express concerns uh, about uh, land use issues um, uh, re regarding uh, something that's either near or in, in downtown. So I don't so remember. How, how close? I didn't pull that up before the meeting, and so it's really difficult for me to speak to that in any detail, sir. So how close is that to downtown? It's, it's basically on the fringe. Um, what, what you have uh, as you're leaving downtown and going down on uh, uh, Common Street, and you uh, and you get on a uh, Fairfield, so that's right on the the edge of downtown. It's on the edge, but not downtown. It's not within the DDA boundaries. Okay, okay. So it's not within the DDA boundaries. It's not within the DDA boundaries specifically, no, sir. And it's not within the historic district that it, that's for downtown either. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Oh, uh, Councilman Nicholson, I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, this does not concern the merits of the appeal that Mr. Sanders has brought uh, on the zoning issue before the council tomorrow. Uh, but I do want to note for the record that Mr. Sanders has made statements on social media that come very close to being criminal threats uh, against an individual who is involved in this process and, uh, and works on behalf of the city tirelessly for its improvement Specifically, there's a reference to destroying everyone and everyone who's plotting against him. Uh, there's a reference to doing that with no limits uh, and then declaring all-out expletive war on this individual and anyone with her expletive expletive. Uh, I'm not inviting a response from anyone in the audience. Uh, and again, I will rule on this appeal tomorrow based on its merits. But I will say uh, to anyone involved in this matter, that threatening city employees does not improve your standing with the city council. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, sir. I didn't uh, threaten. I didn't threaten the. So you got an order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, thought, I thought somebody said I could talk. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't. I haven't seen the, the document you that you referred to. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I trust. Your opinion in that it was very offensive, and, and you, did you say threatening as well? Yes, it appears to be a threat to me, Councilman. I certainly read it that way. Okay. Uh, threatening to destroy someone and declare war on them. I, 
I, it, it just it concerned me, uh, and it is it is not yeah. the sort of discourse that we need so in the chamber. I, I would, you know, I mean, we're going to take this up tomorrow, and my consideration would reflect what I've ascertained from from the uh, <coughs> incident that you mentioned. So I, I look I look to look at that document. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll share it with the council. Thank you. Okay. No, I was Councilman Grant. No, I, I was one that Councilman for. Um, okay. Well, if you're around when it's over, I'm, I'm going to speak to you, Mr. Sanders. Um, if, if, you, if you're around, if not, I, I, I won't I'll speak stay. to you. Okay. I'll stay. Okay. I want to put on record I need to break in. Okay. Oh, Chair? I was, okay. Uh, Councilwoman Fuller. This area is actually in the downtown in the development yeah. district. Um, it is. That's what I'm just getting the message on. So for the record, it is in the DDA. It's in the DDD, the downtown DD, development, development district. district yeah. The development district. Is that confirmed? I just want to make sure for the record that is confirmed. That's confirmed. Okay. All right. We have the following executive appointments to be considered on tomorrow. Um, airport director we just met, Mr. Wade Davis. Uh, Streetport Implementation and Redevelopment Authority Board, Mr. Parker, War pa Parker Brown. Streetport Bossier Convention and Tourism Board, Mr. Matt Smy Snyder. And... Cattle Parish Port Commission, Mr. Joshua Williams. Uh, we all met them on, at the last meeting. There are no items on the consent agenda for introduction to be adopted. Mrs. Jones, you can proceed with regular um, resolutions on second reading and final passing. So. Resolution 132 stating the City of Shreveport's endorsement of Twin Oaks Investments, LLC, to participate in the benefits of the Louisiana Restoration Tax Abatement Program. Resolution 149 authorizing the Mayor to enter into a donation agreement with the Cattle Parish Coroner's Office for two decommissioned structures. Resolution 151 requesting the City Council to extend the time to complete the investigation of a Shreveport Fire Department employee in accordance with Louisiana Revised Statutes 33 dash 2186. Um, Mr. Chairman, this is one that the administration is requesting to be removed after um, the city attorneys conferring with the, the chief of fire de department. Okay. Resolution 152 is authorizing the mayor to accept an in-kind donation worth $19,250 in value from the UVH Foundation to the city of Shreveport, Louisiana to be utilized by the Shreveport Police Department. Resolution 153 is authorizing the mayor to enter into a cooperative endeavor agreement with the Theater of the Performing Arts. Resolution 154 authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement between the City of Shreveport and Carr, Riggs, and Ingram, LLC, for the purpose of an external audit for the city for fiscal year January 1, 2019 through December 31, 2019. Resolution 155 is authorizing a pipeline and roadway right-of-way in servitude agreement for the purpose of allowing Cross Lake Gathering LLC to use the surface of the land to develop the oil, gas, and other liquid and gaseous hydrocarbons in, under, and which may be produced from the land and other land in the vicinity thereof, city-owned property described as that portion of Section 5, Township 17, North Range 15 West, line below the 172-foot contour of Cross Lake, located in Cattle Pierce, Louisiana, with geographic number 171505-000-0008-00, and to authorize the mayor to execute said roadway right-of-way and servitude agreement with Cross Lake Gatherings, LLC. LLC. Um, this is another, Mr. Chairman, I think that we had um, discussions in the um, infrastructure committee that this would be removed also. Okay. Resolution 157 is authorizing adoption of the revised City of Shreveport Sport Train Ch Title VI program. Resolution 158 is providing for canvassing the returns and declaring the results of the special election held in the City of Shreveport, City of Louisiana on Saturday, November 16, 2019, and to promulgate the results thereof. 
Resolution 159 is amending the fact sheet for resolution number 18 of 2018, which approved Inferno man Manufacturing for participating in the industrial tax exemption program at 115 Rico Street to reaffirm the council's decision in resolution number 18 of 2018. Resolution 160 is recognizing Corporal Ernestine Tina Moores for her heroism in saving a citizen from a burning house. Resolution 161 is recognizing Michael Jenkins for his heroism in saving a, citizens from, a citizen from a burning house. Resolution 162 is recognizing the Signal 51 group for the work and support they provide to the Shreveport Fire Department and other public safety agencies in Cattle Parish. Resolution 163 is to allocate funds to specific non-for-profit organizations from funds budgeted and other charges in the 2020 Riverfront Development Special Revenue Fund. Resolution 164 is to remove funding for the Shreveport Bossier African American Chamber of Commerce budgeted and other charges and fund the Minority Supplier Institute in the 2020 Riverfront Development Special Revenue Fund. All right, Councilman Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to, and I was a part of the meeting on, on last week uh, regarding this uh, 155. Uh, I still have some 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 uh, some questions that I need to ask, Mr. Furlow, uh, if, you, if you will. Uh, it was it was discussed in detail. I you know the council the members. Uh, I thought was diligent in in responding to some of the concerns. I, I'm, still, I'm still sort of uh, concerned about what's, what's, what, what's threatening our water supply. Uh, you mentioned at the meeting, uh, the instruction meeting, about some of the, some of the visual hazards that, 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 that come, come into the equation. You mentioned the the railroad. If there's a derailment in the, those bumps, those cars, of, that with chemicals and other substances may come into the water, and that could that could that could be a threat. You mentioned uh, I-220, the bridge where uh, tankers or other uh, transportation apparatus that may somehow spill over into the into the water supply. You mentioned. Uh, an underground pipeline that is currently in the that's running in the uh, in the in the uh, in the lake. What what exactly is that is that apparatus that 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 pipeline that is currently running in the lake? What is that? What does that consist of? Is it pipe material or what is what material? No, no. You you mentioned that there is already a pipeline that's running beneath Cross Lake. Is that yes, correct? Yes, sir. I believe it's transmitting natural gas. Nat it's, trans, it's transmitting natural gas. Yes, sir. Uh, the same, the same natural gas that that um, that is being that is being that is being presented to, to for the for the for the substitute that that um, the, the company that's, that's now presenting a request to to have a pipeline. Is that right? It's the same 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 element. That's my understanding. Same yes. substance. Okay. Uh, but this this pipeline would not run underneath the the uh, the surface of the of the lake. Is that right? It'll run it'll run on the on the boundaries of it. The one being proposed. Yes. It's being proposed to be run under the lake. Under the lake. Yes, sir. Okay. Now certainly. Let me ask you the question before I ask you my other question. Um, these type of these type of uh, uh, developments in, in um, placement of, 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 of material that that would carry things like gas and oil. Is, is, are, are they regulated by the EPA in regards to Shreveport? For instance, if this was a danger to the water supply of Shreveport, would there be a a red flag in in, 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 a, in a proposal to halt this development. Uh, I can't really answer, but I, I have learned that working with federal agencies, they're not always going to step in and 
make decisions for the local entities. There's there's times that local entities have to make decisions for themselves. Yeah. And I think I think it was mentioned even at the meeting that Louisiana has always been sort of leaning with on on oil and gas operations and oftentimes put uh, our citizens at risk of for profit. Uh, but I I uh, I find it. I find it, this me, find it hard to to believe that <clears throat> out of all the all of the hazards that that we face in regards to uh, jeopardizing our water supply, uh, that 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 a, that a gas apparatus would be the most threatening. When I think it will it, it will find its way through pockets and it evaporates. I mean, it's just like leaving a, a gas line on or something, as long as it's not contained in the house where it could blow up, it's going to evaporate into the atmosphere. And I'm just, I'm just trying to feel comfortable that uh, denying something is, is, is in the interest when other items, when other threats are not being looked at, looked at the seriousness on the same, on the same level. I've always been concerned about, uh, I think there's at least 12 to 15 freight trains that go up and down that corridor of, of Cross Lake into the KCS yard daily. And the threat of a, a derailment to, to spill into the water supply would, uh, would cause, what, what dangers that would cause. And yet we, we never talk about that. We never talk about uh, I know there's a hole in being for a runoff from the from the bridge, but 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 we we don't talk about if if an 18 wheeler would accidentally crash through the, the guard railings and splash into the water, and and what 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 would our response be as a city to to protect our citizens from from any substances that may threaten our water supply. It, uh, are those things talked about anywhere? Yes, sir. They are. And there are, there are constituency plans that in place to address those if they happen? Yes, sir. So give me an example of what, what, what would happen if a spill of, 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 of a box car? Or, or well, I'm, I'm not the expert to speak on this. Wes Weish uh, with Environmental Services, he is. Okay. But, but we have had discussions after that infrastructure meeting. Uh, in the past, they have had mock spills where, um, you know, it's it's just like fire and police have uh, mock exercises. If there was a spill, they have procedures that, that are in place for everybody to take action. Okay. So give me the worst case scenario. Will will a spill of any magnitude, we have the, we have the lake, it's, you know, like I said at the meeting, we have um, drainage inlets into the lake all over all the way from here to Morning's Board. If something was to go into the lake, will it, will it affect the treatment plant where our water is purified? Uh, or is that two different, two different uh, relations? Water supply? It, it's, it's hard to say, you know, what's going in the lake, what actions are taken, it's what procedures are in place. It, it's hard to just give a, a blanket answer to that. Well, I can't. I can't go any further because I would. I would think. So if yeah, I mean, if something I mean, who, spills, who, it could. Who, who, it may who, or may who not be able to you. answer questions in regards to the safety of our people and our water. I, I, I find it. I find it disingenuous that we can't get those type of answers. Who can answer those questions? What? what? I'm sorry. Miss Featherstone's coming up. Well, I, I mean, we should. We should be. Yeah. So. Yeah. I hear. I hear. So. It, uh, Real quick, for the I-220 deal, if, if anybody recalls, it's been around a little while, <laughs> there are catch basins on the east side and west side. Yeah. That, but, I mean, are those tested? Do they work? Do the, does the, you know, that's, I think by ideally, I, I, if I remember correctly, that those catch basins on either end are supposed to take whatever product runs into the, the... That's why the bridge is like this. It goes into the... Right, it's supposed to go into those catch basins. So that might be another thing. The other thing that was mentioned that I think, Patrick, that, that maybe is incorrect, that the original line is a distribution line, which has already been treated gas, 
this is a gathering line which is going to bring in is that that's correct that's correct this is a gathering line that will be bringing in untreated natural gas so the treated natural gas already has the smell that's added to it that lets you know that there's a leak and it doesn't have any of the residual condensation and things like that and petroleum that could be in a gathering line so I think it's a little it's two different things now my whole thing is if, if DNR, who I think we referred this to, that, that they were, you know, Mr. Pratt and people that came are, are going to get DNR to come and tell us what the, what the true risk of it is. But I think to go with Councilman, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to bring those couple points up. But I think the biggest thing is I'm, I'm with Councilman Bradford. We, I would like to know where we are as far as the potential hazard, not only with pipelines, but everything else. Those trains going along that, 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 uh, that trussle that they've got is, is very concerning to me every time I see one. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, again. So so your question: is If if anything spills in the lake, is it a is it a hazard to the water? It's just it's a very vague question. I'm sorry, Patrick. Say it a little close and, and repeat that again. Repeat your, your question. Your question of if if any contaminant gets into the into the lake, into the lake. it's going to affect the drinking water. Yes. It's a very difficult question to answer. It has never happened, you think? You're saying, are you saying it never happened? Well, pollutants get in the lake all the time. Oh, I, I know it. I mean, we can't drink it un, un, untreated, you know, we we'll die. But I'm saying if it spills into the lake and, it, and there's, there, there's an apparatus that controls what comes into the, into the treatment plant, the purifying plant, I mean, will that, will that er, er, eradicate the threat of unsafe water? That's what I'm trying to understand. Can that treatment plant dissolve the threat of unsafe water by the way we treat it? You don't know. I'm thinking this is something that our environmental engineer, Wes Weish, can better address. He's not in the chambers at this point. Um, but if we can get him to, um, to get responses to you, would that be appropriate? Well, uh, certainly, but at the same time, uh, there are certain questions, in all due respect, there are certain questions that should be readily available on demand. I mean, when you, especially when you're talking about threats to, to various aspects of the city. But I, I guess I would have to yield and understand that we don't have those answers. And, and uh, if Mr. Weiss can, can relate those, that'll be fine. Sure. And we can, can it's much in the building where we can get him here. That would be helpful. That way we can get the information to you um, this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Councilman Fleury. Uh, Chairman Jerry Bowman, Jr., I'd like to ask at this time, I don't have, I, I don't get the opportunity to serve on this prestigious uh, uh, committee that uh, helped, uh, although I was there and did hear most of the discussion, uh, would it be possible, Mr. Chairman, if uh, a map perhaps could be attached to this legislation. But just merely showing that line going through the duck lines and that north end of the lake up there where there's a very much uh, cypress trees, not a whole lot of lake, more of a sloop. Do you think that would be possible? I don't see why not. Yes, sir. Uh, would you ask the chairman or the clerk of the council if he could uh, get that for us? That's a yes, yes, sir. Thank you. That. Okay. I believe the city engineer is here too. He can. You heard us. Hey, we'll anyway, we'll get that. Let's step out. Yes, we, they just stepped out um, to get Wes so we can get a response to uh, Councilman Bradford's question. Mr. Chairman. All right. When everybody else finishes, I have. Just Councilman Nicholson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we had a robust discussion about this proposed legislation during an infrastructure meeting uh, last week. I share Councilman Bradford's global concerns about the city's water supply. He's absolutely correct that we need to be thinking about potential threats not only from uh, gas transmission pipelines but also from uh, tanker trucks that are crossing uh, the bridge that spans Cross Lake and, and rail cars. Uh, I don't know, and I'm sure Mr. Weiss will tell us, but I suspect uh, that there are some substances that could spill into the lake that would pose a threat to the safety of our citizens, uh, despite the fact that we have appropriate uh, water treatment procedures in place. 
for me, this is, it, it, this is not about uh, whether the proposed natural gas pipeline that is the subject of this legislation is the most serious threat to our water supply. The question simply is, is the benefit to the city, citizens of the city, which would be a payment of only $150,000 for a servitude, worth any appreciable additional risk to our water supply? And, and, and in my view, uh, it's not. I'm still uh, looking forward to hearing from experts on that issue, but if any credible expert expresses the view to this council uh, that a natural gas pipeline transmitting uh, natural gas untreated just 48 inches beneath the surface of Cross Lake poses a threat to the city's water supply, I think it's a very easy conclusion for the council to make that that is not worth doing. Uh, several additional concerns briefly. First, if we allow this natural gas pipeline, uh, where will we stop? Will we have a practice of allowing the bottom of Cross Lake to be crisscrossed with uh, natural gas pipelines every time somebody asks for one? It's true that there is a transmission pipeline beneath the lake, but we were advised by the engineering department during our infrastructure committee meeting last week that that pipeline was there before the lake was created. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, a second concern is the fact that the entity requesting the servitude to place this pipeline is very unlikely to own it in the long term. Uh, the draft servitude agreement that was provided to the council allows that entity to freely assign or, or give away to another entity the right to use that servitude and to place a pipeline beneath our water supply. Uh, and Thirdly, the servitude agreement does not limit the substances that can be transmitted through the pipeline to natural gas only. The description of the substances is broader than that. Uh, I just think it makes a lot of sense from the city's perspective to have a policy of not granting servitudes under our water supply to the extent we have the discretion not to do so. And in this case, going around the, the portion of the lake that I'd like to go under is a very uh, easy thing that will cost a few hundred thousand dollars more for the private entity establishing the gathering system. Their estimate at the infrastructure committee meeting was that this uh, facility will transmit uh, over a decade half a billion, well, they said royalties worth half a billion dollars, so the value of the gas is considerably more than that. Uh, we are not preventing this entity from having its gathering system by refusing the servitude. We are simply requiring them to incur a slightly uh, additional, you know, a slight additional cost so that it doesn't go beneath the city's water supply. And so I, I look forward to hearing from the experts, but I do think this is an important issue uh, that the council should carefully consider. Thank you. All right. Mr. Chair, Councilman Green. I think the whole grid should be shut down. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have authority to do that, Councilman Green. Just throw the whole bridge away. <laughs> All right. Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Are you ready? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, tomorrow we will ask you to postpone resolutions 149, 152, 153, 154, and 155 uh, because we have re-advertised uh, those resolutions. The Charter requires us to advertise certain resolutions and ordinances and to place a date that the Council intends to take action on those resolutions and ordinances. We inadvertently put the wrong date on it, and so we've re-advertised for the 19th, and we would ask you to postpone them uh, until the 19th, and we will identify the ordinances later. Name those again, 149, 152. 149. 152, 153, 154, and 155. Mr. Chairman, the administration has indicated it will withdraw 155. Is that correct? We're, that's a request to withdraw 155. But that, that's just letting you know why we'll be asking you to postpone. Okay. Mr. Jones, would you proceed, please? 
Um, under Section C, ordinance, introduction, introduction of ordinances, Ordinance 189, closing and abandoning an alley in the Kohler subdivision of Tau 20, Shreveport, in Section 37. Ordinance 190 is amending Chapter 78, Section 123, 123 of the Code of Ordinances concerning facility servitude over city-owned property. Going. I'm sorry. Is that new? I don't, I don't, I don't see any requests. Okay. I can keep going under Section D, ordinances on second reading and final passage. Ordinance 166 is amending the City of Shreveport, Louisiana, 2019 general fund budget. Ordinance 167 is amending the general fund budget for 2019. Number 168 is also amending the 2019 budget funding contractual services provided to Sportran by Metro, Metro Management Associates. Resolution, excuse me, Ordinance 169 is amending Chapter 1, Section 1 15 of the Code of Ordinances concerning prosecution fees and traffic cases. Ordinance 170 is repealing Division 3 of Article 3 of Chapter 2 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Shreveport relative to the establishment of the Clean Community Commission. Resolution 171 is amending Chapter 1, Section 1-14 regarding general penalties for unlawful acts, unlawful offenses, and misdemeanors. Ordinance 172 is amending the 2019 budget for the general fund. Ordinance 173 is amending the 2019 Airport Enterprise Fund budget. Ordinance 174 is amending the 2019 Capital Improvements budget. Ordinance 175 is amending the 2019 Capital Improvements budget. Ordinance 176 is amending the 2019 Grant Special Revenue Fund budget. Ordinance 177 is amending the 2019 Community Development Special Revenue Fund budget. Ordinance 178 is amending the 2019 Downtown Entertainment Economic Development Area Special Revenue Fund budget. Ordinance 179 is amending the 2019 Riverfront Development Special Revenue Fund budget. Ordinance 186 is amending and reenacting certain sections of Chapter 94 of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Shreveport, Louisiana, relative to utilities. Ordinance 187 is or an ordinance to amend various articles and sections in the City of Shreveport, Louisiana Unified Development Code. Ordinance 188 is amending the official zoning map of the City of Shreveport Unified Development Code by rezoning property located on the, on the northwest side of Pickett Street approximately 170 feet southeast of Fairfield Avenue, Shreveport, Cattle Pierce, Louisiana, from RUC Urban Core Residential District to C3 General Commercial District. All right. Councilman Nipples. Mr. Chairman, several of the ordinances Ms. Jones has read for us by title concern amendment of the 2019 budget. Uh, I want to call to the full council's attention the fact that on December 3rd, the internal auditor provided at my request a, a list of approximately $1.4 million of expenditures uh, that exceed budgeted amounts by the council. And I mean, not just budgeted amounts initially, but budgeted amounts with amendment. And one of the core functions of the council is to appropriate funds. Uh, and if for any reason uh, those appropriations are exceeded without authorization. That is a very, very serious problem. Uh, in fact, the charter provides that a finance director who authorizes expenditures in excess of appropriations is personally liable for the expenditures. It further provides that any employee who makes expenditures in excess of appropriations without the finance director's consent uh, is uh, that that is grounds for termination. Uh, I had I discussions with Ms. Jones, our Chief Administrative Officer. I know that she is working uh, uh, feverishly to address this issue. But I do want to note my, my very serious concern that that happened uh, and my expectation that whatever accounting system changes need to be made to ensure that, that spending in excess of appropriations cannot be posted is immediately made. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Butcher. What what are and, and I'm I'm gonna ask Ms. Krill this I think. Legally if, if we go over a certain amount, I, I thought that if let's say that um, I don't know, I'm just gonna try to pull something. Let's say that the mayor's budget goes over by ten percent, at that point that's supposed to trigger us 
to reallocate those those funds or make budget amendments. Is that is that correct? Is, is there a is there a number like a percentage? I, I don't think that every time we we go over, we need to be going and and uh, doing an amendment. Is there isn't there a number? If I recall, I am not certain. I would have to look that up. I think we I think we're talking about two different things. Uh, <coughs> One, the charter <clears throat> says you will not go over. I think state law says if you go over more than 10% 10 is what I thought. Of the 5%, uh, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%. Okay. Of the fund, of the total fund, then you have to do an amendment. What kind of, we are talking uh, about character level here. That's, that's correct. But, we, you know, some of these numbers, and I don't know, did everybody in the council get, or just all in the finance committee get this, this email? I believe only the committee has seen this. I mean, we've, we've got some in, in very small numbers, and I'm not going to call out departments, but we've got some very small numbers, like two or three thousand dollars, but it equated to eight hundred and some odd percent above the budgeted amount. So those are those are concerning to me. If it were ten percent here or five percent here or something like, but this has obviously been going on for quite some time, and we have not amended our budget. And I, I, I just want to see what kind of, and, and I think Councilman Nicholson has talked about some safeguards with software and things like that that would be generated to where it brings it to the council where we can amend our budget because we sure want to make sure that we're complying with whatever charter law is and state law. We don't want to be in non-compliance. And I understand, I mean, you know, uh, when I was a fire chief, we, we might have something that might go over budget, have to go put a new pump in a truck, and we would have to amend that budget. Um, I just want to make sure that we have some policies in place that um, – with the administration that brings it to the council before we get to an 800 percent over budget and, and that was a very small number so it's easy to get to 800 percent but it just it just looks bad if i can respond um we did receive a, a copy of that report and we are looking at our security override provisions and making sure that the finance director and the controller are the only two employees who are able to make those adjustments okay. however um, our local uh, requirements is that whatever the council appropriates at the at the character uh, series level, that the budgets do not exceed that amount by any percentage. And so, this current um, ordinance amendments are to correct the 2019 budgets to reallocate funds to come within that amount. Okay. But in the future, what should have happened is that those budget amendments are supposed to come to council in advance before that occurs. Or if there is an emergency or something that needs to be, ha you know, happen in advance, the council is notified, um, and a budget amendment is then forthcoming to be able to make that change legislatively. So as long as we're working to get it corrected, I mean, I'm I'm good. Yes, I, I just, and. I um, and IT, we're working with IT and finance to make sure that that is done by the end of the year, um, pulling the reports, making sure that we're accounting for all employees that have access to the accounting system, and making sure that there are only those two employees, the finance director and the controller, have the ability to make that override. So, so right now, it could be done by other employees, I would assume. Or and that's what we're determining. Yes, we're trying to determine which employees have that capability. Well, I would think And then that with that also, we'll have to revise our internal controls and procedures with accountants. Um, so all of that, that's happened at all levels. Well, I, I, I appreciate our internal auditor bringing this to our attention. I, I don't necessarily think that um, this started in the, in the administration. This started in finance. And I just want to make sure we get this safe place. And I appreciate y'all digging into it immediately because I think immediately when we when we realize this y'all you've been working with Councilman Nicholson to try to get this correct so yes, sir. I appreciate it okay uh, I have Councilman Brown but you did say the finance director and the controller controller right yeah that Those should two. be the only two employees okay I'm sorry Councilman Bradford yes sir Councilman Nicholson tell me again the the the, the amount that you referenced uh, Councilman Brad the amount uh, as of uh, November 30th of this year, uh, there are three amounts, and I, I, I hesitate to do the math in my head and get it wrong, but it's between 1.4 and 1.5 million dollars. Uh, it looks to me, based on comparing that number to an earlier number that was pulled on November 12th, that the amount, but for the budget amendments, would would have hit about two million dollars, which is a significant amount of money, of course, for our budget. So, and and I I haven't been uh, privy to some of some of these uh, overages in budget. So where did the money come from to, to make up for the overage? I, I don't know the answer to that you question, know, do, do you know, uh, do you have an idea where the money 
to make up for the overages, the 1.4, 1.5 million? Do you know where the money came from to, 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 to ensure that those expenditures was paid? Okay. So, uh, see, so is there any any procedures or policies that that would trigger when a when an account became within a percentage of overage? Yeah, and and what I have learned is that our new accounting system does not provide that trigger, um, but it should, and that's why we were wanting to work with IT to find out what employees have that ability and to basically revoke those the ability for them to be able to override. Um, the council appropriates the budget um, within what's called a character series and those appropriations are not supposed to go over without a budget amendment coming to the council. Um, so what's on the agenda right now are budget amendments to make those um, reallocations from other appropriate uh, sub-object series that were under budget um, so that we're not exceeding the total budget but we're within the council's appropriations for each of those sub-object, um, those character series. I understand, but we had budget hearings uh, with, with an impression of what, what our uh, financial ability was and, and this wasn't included in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the fact that we we was trying to uh, deal with some real serious uh, budgetary issues, and uh, now we we have to amend some things that would even further lessen what we have. I, I don't know, you know. Uh, and we haven't gone over over budget with what no, has categorically. We, categorically, we went over budget. Exactly. Yeah, categorically, categorically, but I'm saying if we if we're going to if we're going to characterize our budget, then we did it for a reason, just like we're getting I ready to, admit, to, 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 to to make the adjustments for this year, next year's budget. So we, we're anticipating a certain obligation financially, and if we are wrong in that, we need to, we need to be made aware of that and then make the proper modifications. But I'm saying we can't operate like this. I, I, I don't know. Uh, see, we, we got to, we, people watching us, they, I mean, there's a series of issues that 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 we we'll watch that that, that they, they they will uh, you know not not handling city business properly. We got to do better than this. We better than this. We can do better than this. And I'm hoping that we can you know, live up to the the confidence that the, that the citizens have put in us. Uh, measures has to be in place. We we cannot at the last minute find that we are. In this in this posture in this condition, so hopefully, with Mr. Chairman, we can we can work through this, and, and as we move into the next category of our agenda today, we we're going to be looking at some very serious uh, budgetary issues and amendments that will or will not reflect what we should do. I said earlier that we have to live within our means, and our means are what they are. We can't we can't. You know, spend money twice, and we have to do what we can do. And I hope, I hope for that we can reason together as we move forward to uh, to do what we think is priority and what's right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Councilman Nichols, Mr. Bradford, did, did did you and your wife go to the car lot? Did you, did you look at her getting a new car yet? It's not in our means. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Nichols, uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the administration's commitment to addressing this issue. But I do want to note that the failure of the finance department, in particular the finance director, to implement appropriate controls to prevent the unlawful expenditure of more than $1.4 million is a, a very serious and fundamental failure on the part of that department and that director. Uh, Councilman Bradford and Chairman Bowman, you both work for very large and reputable organizations in our community, and if uh, a department head in one of your organizations were to come to the board of directors and say, oh, I spent more than a million dollars without authorization of the board, that person would be out the door. Uh, we, we have to demand more from the people responsible for safeguarding uh, the, the taxpayers' money. Thank you. All right. 
Councilman Fleury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bradford, uh, Councilman Bradford, uh, that $1.4 million uh, would help me out. That'll probably have to come from reserves to take care of that, or will that come out of street revenue? Well, it's got to be paid. General right? expenses. And Sir? My understanding is there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a catch all, and they keep, they keep pulling from that until, you know, until to make sure that the bills are paid. So if we got some accounts that hadn't spent everything, will come out of those accounts? Is that what, plug and plug them in, or is that what they're saying? Uh, there, there's budget amendments um, that's on the agenda now that accounts for the reallocation of funds that will cover. Um, so we're not over budget, um, but we have to reallocate to make sure that we're within the appropriations that the council but is approved. I got it. Just be sure you no. get it, council. But, but, but James you, Green, not James Fleur. But you're saying that that uh, we are reacting. You're asking how can we be proactive? Is that correct? Right. Okay. And this administration agrees um, that the character series over appropriation should not have happened. Okay. And that's why we're working with the finance department and with IT to make sure that it does not happen again in the future. Um, that is something that I'm confident that we can have implemented over the next couple of weeks. That way going forward, you know, we have 2020 budgets that are on the agenda. Um, that, and you all also receive a report from the finance department each month. Um, and we'll make sure that those are, are not exceeding appropriations in the future. And if something happens and that there is an emergency, that you all will be notified and given the opportunity in advance to respond um, before that happens. But we still, in every case in advance, we have to come to the council with a budget amendment to make sure that we're not exceeding those appropriations. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Green. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, with all that's going on with what I just heard and 1.4 million. When you gave your uh, budget and it was balanced, I was very happy. And since hearing what we just heard and our auditor and all of that, as I look at all of the amendments that has now been attached to the budget, then I look at the budget as being hijacked. And so, therefore, my recommendation to you would be until we get our audit report and our city balance that all of these amendments that's on here, of course, they could have been addressed with the bond issue, but all of these amendments that's on here, if we don't defeat them, I would urge you to veto them uh, until we get our house in order. And then once we get our house in order sometime, maybe in the summer, in the spring, then we can come back with some of these amendments. But I would ask that, and if they pass, since you have the ink pen to approve what happens, then if I were in your seat, I wouldn't approve them until Jesus comes. So that's my recommendation. If we a concern about the audit, if we are concerned about getting our city balanced, then how can we on one end say we got a problem over here with 1.4 million, but then when we get the amendments, then we got everything on here to amend except the kitchen sink. And I think that's wrong. If we're going to be prudent on one side, we ought to be prudent on the other side. If we're prudent about getting this straight, then let us agree to get it straight. Let's get agree to get it fixed. All these amendments that I see, if you had had this on the agenda and your budget was unbalanced, this council would be in an uproar. And so I would advise you that on tomorrow, if they don't all fail, that you would use your veto power and veto all of them until we can get a complete balance from our audit department. And I would be in hopes that the audit committee would support me on that, that we'll get our house in order before we start amending to buying anything or doing anything else. 
And that's, that would, if I was in your seat, I'm not in your seat, I know my job and I know where my line stop at. Uh, I'm here to vote for or against uh, legislation. The council's job is to meet on second and four Mondays and Tuesdays to accept or to reject. Uh, the administration got a whole nother area and I don't cross that line. And so that would be my recommendation to you. I was proud that you had a balanced budget and I'm still proud but then when I see all of these amendments and then when I hear all of these reports and then when I hear before we didn't want to spend 98 cents now we got amendments I, I, I couldn't I can't I, I didn't go to class to count in my head so I hadn't had a chance to count all this stuff up but these amendments are unbelievable so I would ask you, as mayor of this city, that until we get our audit, get all of this stuff straightened out, that we don't put any more debt, that we don't, we don't do that. And, and I, I just, that's just, that's just where I stay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Green. And by the way, every amendment, I'm going to vote against every amendment except for those that you have as what you were describing, the administration. Other than that, I will be voting against all these amendments because I have a job to do. And I'm going to do my job to the best of my ability so that when I go home at night, I can go to sleep and sleep well. I have enough, uh, I've lost enough of my hair worried about the church bills. And so I can't be worried about these council bills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Green, uh, Vice Chair Nipson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to the extent Councilman Green is suggesting that uh, we should be as fiscally responsible as we can, I, I agree with him. I, I do want to make sure that I understand the rules of the road over the next day or two. My understanding is that the uh, administration has no veto over individual amendments. That's not how this process works. And my further understanding is that while the mayor has a line item veto that in the past has not often been exercised, uh, he does not have the ability to veto the budget as a whole. Am I correct, Ms. Creel? I would have to look that up, Councilman. Uh, I can't give you Mr. That clerk? Answer. I thought you were directing it to me. The clerk don't know what's in my head. No, sir. I'm asking him for, for the rules that govern the process. I'm not, I, I, I understood what you said. No, let me explain what I said. This is what I'm saying. We got a 1.4 over Mr. Chairman, I have the floor and I have asked a okay, question. Okay, go ahead. Board. Go ahead. I figured this would press a button. Well, when, when a member of the council says he's going to vote against every, every amendment, one regardless of, of substance, if it's I have the floor. To, hold on. Let me explain this to you. You don't control this seat. You control that one right there. That's the one you control. Get that understanding. You control right down there. Not up here. And because of my amendment rights, I have the right to speak what I'm going to do. When you have the floor. Okay. I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I have to say it is, it's disappointing for a member to say that he will not consider the substance of amendments proposed by any colleague and that he will vote against every one. That's all I care to say about that. And when you have the floor, you can make whatever response you please. Uh, I want to understand if the clerk can tell me whether the mayor has the ability to veto the entire budget. I don't think he does, but if I'm mistaken, I would like to be corrected. And if that question the, can't be answered right now, that's fine. Well, I, I can tell you what I know. Yes, sir. Uh, if an amendment is adopted, then, and the budget is adopted as amended, uh, I think that's the budget. The mayor has a line item veto, but once when we tried to figure out how that's exercised, we had difficulty doing it, and that's that's what, all I can tell you. This well, I, I appreciate that. So I don't want there to be any confusion among the members of the council. Four votes pass the budget. We don't need five because there is no veto to be overridden uh, as it concerns the entire budget. Thank you. All right, Councilman Bradford. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm gonna have to excuse myself after I make these comments. I, I'm, one of my closest friends passed away, and I'm assisting uh, almost 
entirely to, to, to his preparation, funeral, homegoing preparations. And I need to excuse myself with that, to meet with some people. But let me just say this. Uh, the sensitivity of the budget is, is, is important. The mayor presented a, an executive budget for this council. At, at this point, and, and including tomorrow, that, that budget transferred to the ownership of the council. And that's why you hear people say the council carried the purse strings, because now that now the budget we assume we assume the responsibility of, of the budget and make the modifications that we think is necessary. I haven't reviewed all the amendments. I guess I've been preoccupied. Uh, but the responsibility of making sure that we pass a budget that, that is responsive to the needs of this city is what it, is what it's about. It's not a, it's not personal. It's about it's about carrying out the needs of this city. Uh, and that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Uh, it's the council's budget after, t after today, uh, after tomorrow, after, we, after whatever we do. So I'm going to study these tonight, and I'm going I'm to uh, I'm do what I think is, is in the interest of the city. We all should look at what's in the interest of the city, and uh, and we're a democracy, like like you said, and we'll, we'll we'll carry ourselves in that in that order, in a professional and prudent order, to pass a budget that is reflective of the needs of this city. I agree with Councilman Green. I was disappointed with the, when the, when the bond issue. I thought a lot of the needs of the city would have been addressed there, but now we have to do what we can afford, and I keep using that term in our means and, and our ability to, to do what we do, considering the trend of the city, considering the trend of the city. I think, I think, uh, I think we can be together uh, reasonably in agreement that, that, that we are not too far off, even though we have different life experiences, we come from different, different districts. But I think we can reason for what is the priorities and the needs of the city, and I'm going I'm I'm to I'm do that, and I trust that you do it as well. So, Mr. Chairman, please excuse me, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be at disadvantage because I know a lot of the conversation in the, about the amendments would happen but I'll catch up, and I'll be prepared to act tomorrow. Mr. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. We we're going to speak on that and tell you con uh, condolences to your friend. I know that was like a family member to you, so we do understand, and um, uh, take care of what you need to take care of. I appreciate that. Yes, Thank you very much. And I'll relay that to the uh, descendants to, the, uh, to Mrs., uh, Mrs. Simpkins. Thank you very much. I got Councilman Green. Yes. yes. You Mr. Chairman, okay. since uh, Councilman Nichols called me out, Councilman Nichols, I did not attacked you when you uh, didn't support the bond issue, that many of these things should would have been addressed in the bond issue. In fact, you didn't even vote to give the people an opportunity. And I dare you get upset with me because I have my right to speak on whatever I want to speak on. I never said to you, you can't speak on this and you can't talk about this. I mean, I take offense to that. The same thing that it took to get you up here, I went out and got voted in to be up here. So I have one voice up here, and my voice will be heard. And again, I say to the mayor that you gave us a balanced budget. We have a problem over here with Arctic. We have a problem, some problems that we have that was here when we got here, and we have not got them resolved. And so therefore, my recommendation would be, before we go piling on amendments,
that we would be able to bring to this body from the administration and this entire body that we have a clear bill then and only then should we start amending and spending more money. Now that's my request. Now however you feel about that, that's not in your seat. Don't ever cross the line and come to District L because that's my seat. And I won't ever cross lines down in your seat. So however that made you ex excited or whatever, just know your seat is there. This is my seat here. And I have the right, as any other council member up here, to speak what's on my heart or speak what's right for this city. So I'd appreciate it. I will never cross the line with you. And please don't think that I'm a boy that you can cross the line with me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, CAO Jones? Yes. Um, if and when the time is appropriate, um, Wes White is here to speak on Resolution 155 um, regarding a question that Councilman Bradford had. Okay. If it's okay for him to come And up. that's um, if the – I saw a couple of people uh, on the front row, and I was wondering if, if they were going to have the uh, ability to come up and speak, but I didn't receive any um, – a request to speak for him, so that's why we did not call up. I didn't know. Um, Councilman Butcher. Uh, back back to section. the budget real quick. I'm sorry. I hate to interrupt you, but <clears throat> when I look through some of these amendments, and there are very few that I've, I've sponsored or, or been part of, I'm not quite sure that it's spending additional funds that we don't have. It looks more like, to me, reallocation of some funds and maybe some decreasing of some spending that might help us to go have a little bit more of a robust um, surplus. Um, I think that the projection was that with the uh, clean city fee that was passed that there was going to be, and, and I didn't vote for it, so I don't need to be reminded that I didn't vote for the clean city fee, but I didn't, um, that there was going to be a little bit more of a robust uh, reserve. Well, I think we ended up with uh, projected 1.2. 1 1 1.2. I think that some of us on the council thought that we would we would be somewhere hovering around 3 million, a little bit above that at, at the end of this, this fiscal year. I, I personally see it as our job for the record as council members to work with the mayor to make sure his, his budget is balanced. I've always said that sometimes four eyes are better than just two. And this is in no way an insult to anybody, I don't think, because I don't see really any, there may be a couple on here that, that require a little bit of additional spending, but like one of the amendments is taking some money out of a fund that has been used for years and years and probably is gonna be used to make these budget amendments to 2019 Councilman Nicholson's asking to put that into a reserve fund to get what we felt like and what the mayor felt like was a comfortable number with our reserve. So if we can move some things around and work together as a council, but but I, I don't think, you know, I'm not going to vote for everyone on Councilman Green. I, I, can, I can tell you that. But there are a few that, that I feel like that, that justify us voting for and maybe pulling our belt in just a little bit. But we do have issues. But I, I, I hate... Um, for us to sit up in a public body and and argue with each other over um, what I really don't don't see as um, increased spending by the city with any of these amendments, I believe that it's it's just kind of reallocating some things and moving them around, and that's my take. And um, you know, I, I I welcome input from pretty much anybody, but I feel like sometimes there's not. Um, there's not an open line of communications between all of us. Uh, there's a few people talking to a few people and a few people talking to anybody. And my, my phone, my phone is always open to anybody to call me. You know, um, there's been instances where I might not talk to the chairman for a month, but whenever there's something that we really need to discuss, I'll pick up the phone and call him. And he always answers the phone. And I don't think there's ever been a time that Mayor Perkins, even though we disagree, or the chairman, we disagree on things. That I'm not answered that phone and had a had a uh, conversation about how we can get Shreveport to a better spot. So I just want us to keep in mind we all did go through the same election process, and actually it was yesterday, by the way, that we all were elected by the citizens of Shreveport uh, to sit in these seats. 
And I feel like that we have to keep an open mind and work together because I've said it over and over again, as I've sat here and disagreed with pretty much everybody sitting here, including who most people would consider to be my allies on this council. I have disagreed. In fact, I disagreed today with one of them. But the ultimate goal is we've got to get from point A to point B. We've got to. Our future in Shreveport depends on us being able to work together, talk to each other, and amend things. Look at it and just go from there. So I, I just I want to um, to start this next year off with an open line of communications to everybody that sits here and to the administration, and let's start working at making Shreveport better. Thank you, All Mr. Right. Chairman. I have Councilwoman Fuller and then Councilman Green and then we'll pull uh, the CAO, CAO uh, person back up. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to say, if I get glasses, I can have more of a say-so on the budget, because you said four eyes was better than two. Thank you. I don't think that's fair to me and to Councilman Bowman. Thank you. Okay, you're Thank welcome. You. Councilman Green. Councilman, who can you see? Yes, were you, and you reference me, were you talking to me? No, sir, I was talking to all of us as a body. Okay. Well, I do have another thing. In, in okay. um, I would say I want everyone to know, but you in particular right now, Mr. Green, that my amendments weren't meant as a slight to anybody. No, it's not, not personal, but I just want you to know that, like, the proposals I've put forward were just things where I saw we might be able to, to make these little adjustments that they pass, cool, if they don't. I'm not gonna like my feelings won't be heard about it, but I did want I did have a couple of these things. And I know I haven't like reached out to people to explain my rationale on any of them, but um, that's all I want to say is that it wasn't it's not meant as an indictment of the administration. Part of our job is to, as being responsible for the budget is to to bring these ideas to the table to see if it might help us put money to the reserve or or be able to spend some money other places. After we sat through that big red binder and looked at everything together, some some of the different departments come back to you and say, we really have these needs. Is there anything we can do to try to stretch this here or stretch that there? And that's kind of what some of these amendments I think we're trying to do. That's all. Thank you. Councilman Green. And so again, so that I can make myself perfectly clear, I'm not against any of this, all of it is good. My request again was simply, let's get our house in order, and then we go forward. Just simple. I understand. I saw the amendments. It's rearranging money and putting some over here and taking some over there. I did see that, but I said before we do any of that, let's just get our house in order, and then we communicate with one another as to bringing the ideas for as to not taking it in a corner because all these amendments none of them have I been contacted by anybody as to what I thought or whatever yes, sir. and so therefore my only suggestion was is that we would wait until we got our house in order and then we would go forward and I've never said this publicly, but I would like to thank Councilman Flurry. Councilman Flurry, when you voted for that bond issue, man, I know you got talked about. I know you, whatever went down. But I commend you, man, to want to stand up for the people in your district and your city. And I appreciate you. And I know that even in here, you still have a heart to do some of the things that you wanted to do. And I'm with you. I'm with the whole council. My only request is let's get our house in order and then go forward. I mean, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying throw the whole baby out. I'm just saying let us get all of our audit and everything in line and then go forward. That's my request. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. All right. Uh, the next section is... 2020 budget ordinances. Did you want him to come up and speak now, or? Yes. Is that is it okay? No, that's, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, this is Wes White. She is um, our engineer under uh, Environmental Services. There was a question that Councilman Bradford had regarding um, the city's contingency plan for any hazardous um, events that happen along the lake, and I just wanted him to speak to that. Um, 
Wes White, engineering, and uh, I'm probably the only non-engineer in the engineering department, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, my area of responsibility is the environmental services uh, section of, of the department, and we oversee uh, a number of different uh, issues, one of which is Cross Lake. We, uh, we have a Cross Lake watershed program, and the goal of that program is to, is to protect the lake. So uh, we have a staff, we have a three-person, uh, we wish we had four, we have a three-person staff that that's their job, is to inspect the watershed, pull samples, uh, monitor activities that are going on in the watershed that have, have the potential of, of affecting the lake. So and one, th one thing I would like to say, and a point I, that I made the other day and would like again to make is with a surface water body, you cannot not have issues. You're going to have issues. They may be, in, all, in most cases, they're going to be minor. They're not going to be anything that's going to be a concern from a drinking water standpoint. What we try to do is to, to guard against, monitor for major problems. And that's what our guys do. And, and one thing that we have, and, and the city should be should be happy about and thankful for is we actually have a watershed management program. Most communities that depend on surface water for drinking do not have this. Um, and we're, we're, there's several circumstances that, that are in our favor that allow this to happen. One is the location of, of the watershed. It's in an area that, that um, is not substantially impacted by most of the stormwater drainage in the city. Another is the city actually has authority that was granted to it by the state legislature to enforce water quality issues in the watershed beyond the city limits. It's not something that you would expect to see. And uh, sometimes we, we have raised eyebrows when our trucks roll up at somebody's house. It's 10 miles outside the city limits because we have a concern about what may be going on out there. We actually have the authority to take action. And that's not something I, I, I hear it all the time from other cities that depend on surface water for drinking. They don't have that ability. So that's what we do. We, we try to, to prevent there from being issues in, in, in the lake. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm, <laughs> I'm addressing the specific question, but that, that's what our watershed management program tries to do. I wish, I wish Mr. Bradford was still here, and maybe we need to, maybe we need to bring this up whenever he gets back. Um, or maybe we need to maybe come up with a list of questions and maybe address it on the 19th one. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to, and I'm trying to recall something. I think that, you know, we're talking about our water supply. We have several tributaries that go into the into Cross Lake. Right. That's correct. Yeah. And wasn't there a leak somewhere up, golly, in Mooringsport or something like that? That was an oil leak that was threatening Cross Lake at some point. They had to put up dykes and all that stuff. If it were around about two or three years ago? Uh, yeah, we had one, uh, not around Mooringsport, but further, I guess, south of there t toward the west. Our guys, our, our watershed staff, actually came across an area where there, where an oil pipeline had ruptured, and they were able to, they found it. We didn't know about it, but for the fact that our guys found it and uh, made sure that cleanup took place, made sure that there was no off-site issues that resulted from it. Of course, so it does happen. I'm, I'm extremely concerned about about anything that could pollute our water system. I mean, our drinking water is, but I think a lot of people lose sight that, that Bossier City gets their water from the Red River, which has many more tributaries flowing into it. Um, so I guess that when, in relation to the application for the pipeline, I just want to make sure that we do our due diligence and make sure that, uh, because it is going to be untreated from what I understand, and we'll, I'll ask that question to them, that it will be, it's more of a gathering line, not a distribution line. And, and I think that from what I'm hearing and from what I've seen in the past, even there was a question asked by Councilman Bradford about the Cross Lake Bridge. I remember when they constructed it, it was built kind of at an angle, and there's like these reservoirs that right. run underneath it, and they go into holding ponds on the east and west side. I right. mean, that's, that's all checked regularly by the city, I would say. It's ch yeah, of course, the bridge is DOTD, but, but in fact, we have been in touch with DOTD over the past few months 
we try to, to stay in touch with them yearly to make sure they're inspecting that system. And they just completed an inspection, and I understand whatever issues they found within the next week or two they're supposed to, to address. But there is a fail safe in place if an 18-wheeler tanker truck Correct. carrying some hazardous material were to, were to spill. The, the second issue that's been raised is the train, which I think is a little bit more concerning even than the pipeline. Are there any federal grants out there that could move that train track? Have we looked into that? We have looked into it. We have not had any luck with that. Uh, most of the rail yard actually is outside of the watershed, even though it's near the lake. Most of the switching, most of the, act, the uh, you know, active part of the process is actually downstream of the lake. A small portion of that yard does drain to the, to the lake. My, my concern is it going right over the dam. Right. I, mean, yeah. I mean, if we could take that small section, which I would assume is 10,000 feet, some, something like that, mm -hmm. and maybe reroute it, that would be something that I think that maybe the administration should maybe look at and talk to the federal government about getting that away from our water <coughs> our water source if, if it could happen. You don't think that can happen? Listen, you're going, these people have, KCS Railroad is one of the premier railroads in the United States. They run almost all into Canada and Mexico. <coughs> they have a good track record. You, you're making something well, that is not. But there was there was a concern brought up by another council member, and I. I know. I, 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 do you know what his question was? Y'all chase these rabbits all afternoon. You know what his question was? What is the protocol if the 18-wheeler flips over the rail, not spill, but goes over the rail into the lake? That's what Councilman Bradford wants to know. What is the protocol? I, and I the 911 is called. Wolverton, he gets out there. Then he gets a hold of the uh, 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 environmental people. You've been a fireman. You know there's a protocol. That's what Councilman Bradford wanted to know. What is the protocol? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Butcher. Um, having said that, I think we get everything we need. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Said you tired y'all chasing these rabbits. <laughs> yeah. Y'all yeah. <laughs> chase rabbits on your own time. What else can be said after uh, that? Mr. Clark, we have Mr. Pratt and some other representatives of that entity. Uh, what is the proper procedure for allowing them to speak now? A motion to suspend the rules, or can we invite them so without moved, that? Chair. All right. Second. Was that even necessary? I'm not sure, but I want to do things right, Council Mr. Fuller. Okay. So there's been a motion to suspend the rules, properly seconded. Please vote. Fleur, you sent some of them flat rabbits over this <laughs> Council. The motion carries with five, two out of the chamber. Mr. Pratt, would you like to speak, please, sir? All right, thank you, um, Mr. Acting Chairman and uh, council men and women uh, in the mayor's office. Uh, on last week, we did meet with the infrastructure committee. Uh, I forgot to say, uh, Paul Pratt, 935 East 70. Uh, today, I have my client here, Pine Wave Energy Partners from Fort Worth, Texas. I uh, did tell them uh, early this year that Shreveport was open for business. And they talked to me about their grand ideal of oil and glass exploration in our city. Uh, not only are we seeking a servitude right away agreement with the city of Shreveport, we do have other things that we're requesting. Uh, the purchase of water, for example, which would lead to about a million dollars in revenue for the city of Shreveport. Um, but last week we did request a meeting so that we can talk about this where uh, we can ease some of those concerns regarding safety around our public drinking water. Um, pipeline safety is probably one of the safest means for transporting natural gas in America right now. Uh, we're not talking about oil, we're talking about natural gas. Uh, I do have um, Neil Hamilton here who represents Pine Wave Energy Partners. Uh, who would like to come up and say something about their safety record and them wanting to come into the Shreveport community and be a, a great corporate citizen, not just to transfer, uh, transport uh, oil and gas or natural gas here, but to be embedded in this community by uh, helping us to grow. In addition to that, uh, we have Mr. Jamie Burns, who represents the Department of Natural Resources. I know last week there was some um, uh, debate about who are actually the experts about oil and gas development. They're the ones that regulate pipeline development as well as drilling. And so 
we invited him here today to talk about the safety record of, um, of natural gas development as well as uh, uh, pipelines. So I'm going to ask Neil to come up first, and then we'll hear from Jamie Burns. We just wanted to go on the record. I know this is still language that we're talking about uh, putting this together. We just want uh, the city to be open. Um, let's discuss. Let's make this work. And if we can't make it work, uh, we'll find other means to uh, make it work somewhere else. Uh, but I just want you guys to be open. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, as Paul mentioned, my name is Neil Hamilton. I'm the land manager and representative for Pine Wave Energy Partners and Cross Lake Gathering. Um, I really wanted to just introduce myself and let you guys and, and girls know that um, all of your concerns were heard uh, last week from at the uh, at the infrastructure committee meeting. And Councilman Nicholson, I wanted to further uh, address some of the things that you uh, mentioned earlier in regards to the agreement, 48-inch um, depth. Um, and the, the product that is going to be running through the line. Um, and there was a, there was a third um, request from the engineering group as far as um, that we there be no disturbance of the surface of the land. All of those have been addressed. Um, 48 inches is the minimum depth that we've been told uh, will be required, but that's surely not only what we will adhere to. We plan on being get a bit deeper than that. We are working with engineering to come to an agreement as to where that might be. Um, so, and also, uh, from a product standpoint, we in our revised agreement we, that we submitted to engineering, we are working to hone in on what the exact products will be that are running through that line. So all of the specifics that have been addressed by engineering have been resubmitted to Mr. Patrick Furlong and the engineering group, and we're working through that diligently, and we, again, um, we want to do business with you guys, and we're trying to partner with, with every person and resource that we can to get your questions answered and your needs met. And, and I think most importantly, we start with the Department of Natural Resources and, and Jamie Burns, who's with the Pipeline Division, and can maybe answer any of your questions that you may have. Jamie? Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Burns. I'm with the Department of Natural Resources. I'm a conservation program manager. I've been with the department since 2011, and I oversee uh, the inspection of natural gas and hazardous liquid pipelines for northwest Louisiana. Uh, it, at this time, if you have any questions related to uh, the industry. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Nicholson. Uh, Mr. Burns, thank you for being here today. Uh, if you would, please, what is, uh, you've told us your position, are you an engineer? I am not an engineer. I, I'm an inspector. Okay. Uh, I graduated from Northwestern State University, uh, bachelor's degree, concentration in unified public safety administration and social science, uh, and I've been with the department since 2011 doing inspections. Uh, how many uh, lakes, which are primary water supplies, have natural gas pipelines running under them in northwest Louisiana? That's a very good question. Uh, I will be happy to go back and speak with the office so we can give you the correct amount uh, that, that do have those pipelines running under. Okay. I, I understand from our infrastructure committee meeting that there, there is a transmission pipeline that was there before Cross Lake was mm -hmm. built. Are you aware uh, of any other, well, let me ask it this way so you'll be sure to know the answer. Have you inspected any pipelines or acquire knowledge of any pipelines beneath Cross Lake since you joined the department in 2011? No, I have not. Um, are you familiar with the sort of the status of construction of this gathering system that this company is, is building generally? No. Uh, what happens in our process is uh, what we do is we oversee construction for regulated pipelines, whether it be transmission, gathering, distribution. Uh, when when they are going to be regulated at that point, that, that is when we take over in that process. As of right now, uh, the pipeline in question is not regulated, so we, we don't have any part of that process. Not regulated because it's not yet uh, ready to gather. That's right. That's right. Um, do, I mean, you've inspected these pipelines mm -hmm. since 2011. Do natural gas pipelines sometimes rupture or leak? They do. That that happens. Yes, sir. Uh, is it is it possible that a natural gas pipeline placed under Cross Lake might at some point in the future rupture or leak? 
as an absolute possibility. Um, this may not be a question for you, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll ask it because you're here to, to, to provide support to the company or to answer our questions. Uh, why should we not require this company simply to go around the lake? I mean, wh why should the city grant a servitude for $150,000? for a pipeline that might leak at some point in the future? Well, for our department, we, we don't promote uh, the construction of pipelines. We simply promote the safety of transportation. So uh, if you so do like enter into a partnership and we regulate it, what we do is, is we make sure that, uh, that all of the applicable codes in 192 are upheld uh, for that gathering system. Well, I, and I appreciate that clarification. I'll restate it just so that it's clear for the record and, mm -hmm. and the public. You're not here to advocate for the construction of this pipeline. I am not. The department takes no position on whether this pipeline should or should not be placed under crossway. No, sir. We, we are, uh, we've been asked that if, if you do engage in a partnership, uh, that as a regulatory authority, uh, that, that we do become a part of the process of the construction and for uh, all the monitoring and regulatory compliance. Okay, but those are all my questions, Mr. Chairman. All right. No one else? Council Member Um, No, just a statement that we will be going back into another infrastructure committee meeting where we can further discuss all of this. But I think it might be helpful if we send you questions ahead of time so you all can actually be prepared. Absolutely. At, at any time, if, if like anybody has any questions. Today, we might have actually suggested that so that you might have answers for us. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, I, I would like, Mr. Chairman, to address the question of the gentleman from uh, Fort Worth. Are you, are you, you're from Fort Worth? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yes, yeah. I am. Okay. State your name again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. State your name again. Neil Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, I just want to look, I want to thank you for being here and reiterate what I said in the Infrastructure Committee meeting, which is I am in no way opposed to oil and gas development in sure. the state. Uh, oil and gas is a critically important part of our economy. Uh, that's not why I raised the concerns that I did. Uh, I'm just trying to understand from the city's perspective uh, why we shouldn't uh, politely de decline the request for a servitude under the lake and suggest that you just go around it. I know there's some additional cost. Uh, one of your representatives at the infrastructure committee meeting said those costs would be in the range of $650,000. Uh, that's a lot of money by any measure, but if you're talking about a gathering system that is going to move billions of dollars of gas over its lifetime, it, it's it's not an insurmountable sum by any means. I, I assume that this gathering system is already largely constructed. Is that true? Uh, a portion of it. Okay. This is our last leg of, of right-of-way. Okay. So, we, so uh, you've acquired right-of-way for everything except this. That's correct. And so just in candor, if, if we decline a servitude, uh, you're not going to not build your gathering system. You're just going to in incur additional costs to take another route. Isn't that true? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very much. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none. Ms. Jones, you want to continue? I'm sorry. Would you like to continue? Yes, sir. I will. <laughs> um, the next section is 2020 budget ordinances. Um, ordinance 140 is adopting the 2020 capital projects fund budget. 141 adopts the 2020 Riverfront Development Fund Budget. Ordinance 142 adopts the 2020 General Fund Budget. 143 adopts the 2020 Retained Risk Fund Budget. 144 adopts the 2020 Metropolitan Planning Commission Fund Budget. 145 adopts the 2020 Community Development Special Revenue Fund Budget. 146 adopts the 2020 Grant Special Revenue Fund Budget. 147 adopts the 2020 Shreveport Redevelopment Agency Special Revenue Fund Budget. Ordinance 148 adopts the 2020 Downtown Entertainment Economic Development Special Revenue Fund Budget. 149 adopts the 2020 Golf Enterprise Fund Budget. Ordinance 150 adopts the 2020 Airport Enterprise Fund Budget. 151 adopts the 2020 Water and Sewerage Fund Budget. 151 adopts the budget funding contractual services provided to Sportran by Metro Management Associates, Inc. 153 adopts the downtown parking enterprise budget. 154 adopts the 2020 convention center enterprise fund budget. 155 adopts the 2020 convention center hotel enterprise fund budget. 156 adopts the 2020 debt service fund budget. 157 adopts the 2020 solid waste enterprise fund budget. 158 adopts the 2020 street special revenue fund budget. 159 adopts the 2020 downtown development authority budget. 
Councilman Nicholson? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, briefly discuss two amendments that I propose that would move money from the Street Special Revenue Fund to the General Fund. The first concerns the General Fund Operating Reserve. Uh, the Council and the public will recall that in connection with uh, discussions uh, about the need for a sanitation fee, which I did support earlier this year, uh, we all agreed that the General Fund Reserve that was budgeted for 2019, which was in the range of $3 million, was too low, was not a responsible number for revenue in excess of $200 million. Uh, the CAO uh, agreed to that proposition. The mayor certainly did, and he, he spoke quite well, I thought, about the importance of fiscal responsibility and ensuring that we uh, do not spend beyond our means. Uh, the mayor inherited uh, a, a budget and a, a system that had substantial challenges, uh, and, and so I do not fault him when I note uh, that the proposed 2020 budget provided for a general fund reserve of only $1 million. Uh, that, is, that is just not enough, in my view, uh, for, uh, to responsibly safeguard the city and its fiscal stability. And so one proposal that I've made by amendment is not to spend additional money, but to transfer $3 million from the Street Special Revenue Fund to the general fund and then allocate that $3 million to the reserve. That would bring the reserve from a little more than $1 million to slightly more than $4 million. $4 million is still inadequate, but it is movement in the right direction. And I really think we need to treat the 2019 reserve as the number below which we will not go. Okay, $3 million is too low. It has to move in the other direction, even if that requires some sacrifice. We can approve this amendment, and if there is some unforeseen event during 2020, we can allocate funds from the reserve. Uh, but our starting point needs to be a general fund reserve that is more than, not less than, the 2019 reserve that was budgeted. Uh, a second amendment uh, of some consequence, which I'll call to the Council's attention and which I proposed, is an amendment to move $1 million, an additional $1 million, from the Street Special Revenue Fund to SPAR for building maintenance. We have discussed all year the fact that the city has chronically neglected its infrastructure, uh, including the buildings that it owns. Uh, everybody on the council recognizes that that is a, a very serious problem. Uh, and I, I frankly think that one concern the public had in connection with its consideration of the recent bond propositions which were defeated is the fact that we are not taking care of the property we already have. So this is the first budget that this council has considered and had the opportunity to pass. And I am urging my colleagues to turn over a new leaf and allocate sufficient funds to SPAR to maintain the buildings and the other property that the city owns. Uh, these are apolitical, good government budget amendments. They don't have anything to do with being conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat. They're just about being responsible with the taxpayer funds with which we have been entrusted. And so I, I urge my colleagues to consider supporting both these amendments. Thank you very much. Right. Mayor Perkins. Um, I want to want to jump in for a second. John, I, I appreciate that early vote with the, the sanitation fee. I, I also appreciate you being extremely responsible fiscally and being aggressive as well. Like we have to be aggressive if we're going to climb out of this hole. Uh, however, the uh, one million in reserve that we put forth this year, we have to remember that August audit where we were 1.5 in the negative. So that one million aggregate is about 2.5. Uh, we all were granted four years by our citizens. So we have three additional budgets after this. My proposal is to gradually grow our reserve up to the recommended amount by Raiders and our own uh, city policies by the, by the time that we get out. So that, year, so that way, every year we're making incremental growth within that reserve fund. Um, I heard somebody said the definition of leadership is uh, making people comfortable with change. Uh, so if we go all out right now and we take $3 million out of that spe street special revenue fund, 
Uh, there are going to be a lot of communities in this city that needs their roads repaired, which you know the bond would have addressed, uh, that are going to be in a much worse predicament uh, over next year, and that a lot of communities that can't afford it. So that's the reason why I have some concerns about the transfer of $3 million to the reserve. I agree with you in principle that the reserve should be healthier. Uh, I just want to get there over a longer runway. Thank you, Matt Perkins. Uh, Councilwoman Fuller. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a couple of little amendments. And the one I wanted to talk about was the one to the Riverfront development for the grant researcher. I do believe that that is a valid, uh, it'll be a valid employee to have in the future. But I'm proposing that we give the MPC back their, their planner this year using that 40 plus another 25 from Riverfront Development, just so we can keep that department running and maybe get it running a little faster, and then come back and look at that other position next year. Um, and my other thing is the, my, um, the resolution amending for, the, uh, for MSI. I would like to amend, do an amendment to that for it to be 50 to MSI and 25 to African American Chamber if people would be amenable to that. What was that again, Councilman? 50 to MSI and 25 to African American Chamber. Yeah. Oh. Sure. Mayor. Uh, I yield to the mayor. Mayor Parker. Yeah, so, so two things. The, um, the MPC, it wasn't, if you look at the, the, the fiscal uh, construct of the MPC and the budget that they get from public, on the public side, uh, it's not, it wasn't anything to necessarily cut their budget, it's to put more uh, pressure on the parish to contribute to the MPC. Uh, right now the parish, is con the parish contributes about 300,000, we contributed 800,000, and we have the same amount of board seats. Uh, no private company is structured that way where you get the same amount of representation but they invest less. Uh, so I would encourage, I think it would be, Knowing our fiscal position in the parishes, I would encourage us to join together to ask the parish to fill that gap. Uh, I, I like the, the funds, and it kind of goes back to what I want to do with the Street Special Revenue Fund to remain dedicated to what they're supposed to be for. And that Red River Development Fund uh, in its bylaws talked about economic development entities, so I want to keep the, the funding there. Uh, and the last point about the MSI versus the African American Chamber, that's going to be up to the council how you all divvy it up. My, my suggestion uh, was put forth because of an objective measure that I'd like, to, I'd like us to go from going forward. And we can write this out in policy, but I'd much rather see our dollars invested in institutions that can justify in a granular way where each dollar is going and the impact that they're having. Uh, on the community. The African American Chamber provided it. I did not get that from MSI and maybe it can be provided. Uh, so that's going to be up to you all how you, how you decide that. But that's our justification why the budget is allocated in the manner that it is right now. Mr. Chairman? Okay. Councilman Butch, I'm sorry. So, so if we allocate 50 to, you're saying 25 to the African American Chamber? Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, I, I, I know I ain't nobody, but I, I don't agree. But I'm gonna leave that. What is that? Uh, I don't. I'm, I think that um, Mr. James, I found myself in some in a pickle, um, and I, you know, unfortunate. That's that's unfortunate. But um, I'm just standing why 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 I stood at before, and I'm against that period. That's okay. I'll still bring you cookies. A cookie tomorrow. It's gonna be a long meeting. Bring you snacks. Okay. Uh, we have tables. Do we have any table legislation? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to. What's the, what's the diction? Take up from the table, remove from the table. What do we? To remove from the table uh, ordinance. 161 of 2019 so that the council can further consider that legislation on the 19th of this month. What is that, John? Th this, this concerns the alcohol hours that okay. we discussed yeah, during the meeting. Yeah, I was going to bring today. that up in a minute. But yeah. um, so 
So we're going to do what? 2161? We're going we're gonna to move to remove it from the table. Can we do that tomorrow? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. We should do that tomorrow. Thank you. Remind, uh, put it on. We'll remind you. We'll remind you. I'll remind you. Just 161. What about 162? I, I, I don't want to take 162 off the table yet. Thank you. In a table legislation? Um, I'm trying to get that. I don't think so. Okay. We don't have any practice time. We don't have any appeals today, am I correct? Well, Mr. Chairman, on tomorrow, uh, we place the appeal back on for the uh, tower. And tomorrow, uh, based on the actions, on, on the uh, Mr. Flurry's uh, intent, I think we will take that off and we would ask you to, to remove that from the agenda tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. That's the MBC case number 19-301-WFC. It was only put on there in the event that his motion was adopted. Okay. All right. Are there any reports from any officers, boards, or committee? Mr. Chairman. Councilman Butcher. The uh, Public Safety Committee met today at 1030. Um, we discussed three items, um, two of which were the uh, Ordinance 161 and was it, what was it, John, 160? Uh, it's, uh, 161. Ordinance 161 and 162. Um, which dealt with uh, sale of alcohol in the city limits of Shreveport. Um, the committee moved to remove the uh, distance uh, which I think that was 161. Um, at this point, we're going to have further discussions with the Metropolitan Planning Commission as well as um, as uh, the police department about where we're going to go with that. Uh, the second one dealt with the hours of operation. It was voted on by myself and um, Councilman Nicholson and Councilman Flurry, uh, and it passed unanimously, unanimously that uh, we will be making a recommendation to the council that all liquor stores in the city limits of Shreveport will be closed by 11 o'clock Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday, and uh, or that be Sunday through Thursday, correct? Yes, sir. And then um, they will be allowed to stay open until midnight on Friday and Saturday. So we will try to get that on the agenda for the 19th <coughs> meeting, I believe, which will require two readings. Uh, just a note: um, there were some representatives of uh, liquor stores there. And there was there was really no opposition to that that time change. Um, <clears throat> the second or the third thing that we discussed was the possible BHP building at the corner of Preston and uh, Knight Street. We we did take a tour there. The uh, police chief and I would say a good number of his executive staff uh, visited the building with us, along with Councilman Flurry and Councilman Nicholson and myself and uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, exactly. I, I will say that the building, I believe, uh, fits some of the boxes. However, I think that uh, I'm not the police chief and I'm not the one making the decision. So uh, I will say this, that I believe it's a consensus of the Public Safety Committee that whatever the chief decides, we will work with him in any way we can. I think one of the big things about the, uh, is the design of the building that's split up into four different parts. Uh, it has a, a center core and then it splits off. The building is very well constructed. I think Chief Chief Smith, who is in the uh, construction business, went over it with a fine tooth comb. I saw him counting a lot of ceiling tiles. So I'm assuming he was looking to see how big things were. Um, a lot of the furniture in the building is brand new, never been used, and is negotiable. Uh, there's some really interesting teleconferencing uh, equip, equipment in a conference room that could be used to uh, I would assume communicate with police officers in the field or uh, or with substations if that's where we go. I think the biggest thing that we have to discuss is number one, does it fit the police department's needs? It is 20 acres of land, which is attractive. Uh, we do have a, a road project going on right uh, or about to start on East Preston um, that could possibly give us a little bit more parking if we ever needed it. And according to the architect who is a Shreveport resident, and does business here, um, there is a possibility that if we ever needed expansion, we could go up to a third floor. 
So there's plenty of room there for us to do what we need to do. But having said all that, we have to find a way to fund it, number one, and we have to make sure it, make, it fits the needs of the police department. So um, I just think that it's a good idea for us as legislators and leaders of the city to try to find different ways. Um, I was for Proposition 2. I've said it over and over again. I voted for it. Um, but it didn't happen. So now we're back. You know, one of, the, one of the first texts I got from somebody that's usually at these council meetings was, well, what are you going to do now? Well, if you don't want me to do something, don't ask me what I'm going to do because I'm going to try to figure out something. And uh, so uh, the mayor was extremely receptive when I called him. Uh, he had another obligation was not able to make it. But I think the police chief represented him well. And uh, I'm excited about the potential of this. And I will do everything in my power to try to find the money to, for us to be able to get this if this is what the chief thinks he needs. Thank you. All right. Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Chief, would, would you come up, please? Thank you, Chief. Uh, Chief, I, I just want to say I appreciate all of you. I appreciate everything y'all do. I did everything that was in my power to get this fund issue passed. I, I, I made videos. I talked on the radio. I did everything. And I know that you and uh, Chief Wolverton, when, when it failed, I know your hearts was hurt. But I also want to say to y'all, keep the faith of delay is not a denial. Sometimes um, God allows things to happen just to bring us closer to him. And in my life, I don't settle for the this or for the that. If I ask God for something, I just believe that he's going to deliver, but it's going to be in his time. And I'd just like for you to just pass the word on to all of the people, and you, you also, Chief, that a delay is not a denial. I, I believe that all of this is going to happen in due season. It's just that in America today, there's an evil spirit. There's a bad spirit. People are just mad about whatever. It was not a bad bond deal. It's just that it was basically almost 50-50 that people say yes, people say no. But I'd just like for you and your people to know, and as well as your chief, that a delay is not denial. And I believe that in due season, all of this is going to come. And I just wanted to give you those encouraging words. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Thompson is there, clerk's report. The only thing we have is we have uh, an executive session this afternoon uh, when we get to that point on our agenda. But I don't think there's anything on the clerk. We are there. That was tomorrow. No, it's today. <coughs> okay. Tomorrow's long. Well. Thank you. 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 Mr. Chairman, we need a motion to go into executive so session. Move a second. Uh, on the Dan Danny C. Weaver versus City of Freeport, suit number 589217, First Judicial Court, Gatto Parish, Louisiana. All right. Do we got a vote? It's been moved by Councilman Green, second by Councilman Butcher. And the votes are that passes. Everybody, five, five two. Yeah. 